Good morning, everyone. Um, calling the meeting to order. Uh, um, why don't we go ahead and get started? Uh, today's May 25th, 2023. Uh, it is 10.03 and uh, calling to order the Wildlife Conservation Board meeting. Um, and I will hand it off to Mary to go over roll call, please. Okay, so we have Chair Alina Boke. Uh, here. Vice Chair Chuck Bonham. Here. Michelle Perot for Department of Finance. Here. Board Member Nate Damon Nagami. Here. Board Member Fran Pavley. Here. Board Member Catherine Phillips. Here. Board Member Eric Scalar. Here. And then um, for Senator Stern, Catherine Moore. Here. For Assembly Member Rick Zaburr, Jane Park. For Assembly Member Luz Rivas, Omar Hashim. For Assembly Member Steve Bennett, Candace Cotton. Okay, we have a quorum. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so now we will move on to item number two. Um, any public comments uh, on any items that are not on today's agenda? Do we have any uh, public comments, Rebecca? Um, I don't have any speaker cards. Alexa, is there anybody online raising hands? We have one raised hand. Go ahead, please. Doug Johnson, you should be able to unmute yourself. Great, thanks. Um, good morning, board. Um, Doug Johnson from the, <clears throat> excuse me, Nonprofit California Invasive Plant Council. Um, we work with land managers across the state on protecting biodiversity with a focus on invasive plants, a top ecological stressor. And while we have typically focused on projects before WCB, that um, focus on invasive plant removal, I'd like to address something slightly different, which is the potential for other implementation projects to spread weeds. On today's agenda, there are projects that are building roads, trails, levees, boat ramps, solar arrays, um, and pipelines, or restoring wetlands, meadows, coastal prairie, pollinator habitat, forests. And all of these activities are likely to introduce and or spread invasive plants on site through equipment, construction materials, and personnel. And there are best management practices that have been developed um, for avoiding inadvertent spread of invasive plants. And it's important that all these projects use them. It's a key aspect of prevention, um, which is an important part of addressing invasive plants. And Prevention is the cornerstone of the state's new sustainable pest management roadmap, which seeks to reduce pesticide use. Um, a couple of the construction projects on the agenda do mention the need to prevent invasive plant spread, which is great. That should be standard for every implementation project. So to make sure that invasive plant prevention BMPs are explicitly integrated into each project, we'd like to propose that WCB consider requiring that each implementation proposal describe how invasive plant spread will be prevented in the proposed project, similar to the way you now require that projects detail their integrated pest management approach to controlling invasive plants. So whether it's an additional questionnaire or simply integrated into the proposal form, um, we think it's important that all applications uh, for implementation projects address the topic of how they will prevent invasive plant spread from their activities. Thank you. Thank you. And we have one more raised hand. Amber Jamison, you may now unmute yourself. Hi, thank you for the opportunity to comment. This is a general comment um, relating to the use of herbicides to control invasive plants. Um, according to the EPA, glyphosate is likely to injure or kill 93% of plants and animals that are protected under the Endangered Species Act. 
and the EPA's biological evaluation found that glyphosate adversely modifies cri critical habitat for 96% of endangered species that have critical habitat designated. Um, the California Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment has listed glyphosate as carcinogenic, and the CDC has released data showing that 80% of human urine samples collected from 2013 to 14 contain glyphosate, and even more so in children, with 87% of children tested having positive glyphosate in their urine. Regulatory agencies are failing to protect us from exposure to toxic chemicals, and I hope that the, the Wildlife Conservation Board stops funding the use of these toxic herbicides that are known to use cancer. Um, glyphosate has a 22 year half-life in the soil. And there are already movements going through uh, California legislature like AB 99, which would ban the use of glyphosate by Caltrans along our roadside statewide. And this has passed through all of the subcommittees thus far. I think that the Wildlife Conservation Board is in a position to help pioneer ways towards a less toxic environment and would request that the Wildlife Conservation Board no longer fund the use of chemical herbicides um, in our public areas or with our public funding. I do have comments on item 18 and 25 as well, so that I'm done for the general comment period. Thank you so much for your time and I appreciate the Wildlife Conservation Board is looking at alternatives to glyphosate or at least um, investigating glyphosate and herbicide use more so and I hope to see it on the agenda in future uh, meetings. Thank you. And we have one more raised hand. Kian Shulman, you may now unmute yourself. Good afternoon esteemed board members. I'm Kian Shulman, Director of Poison Free Malibu. We kindly request your support in restricting fundings for projects involving chemical pesticides. Southern California boasts several pesticide-free locales engaged in landscape restoration and maintenance. In May 2021, the Coastal Commission adopted Malibu's local coastal program amendment. It prohibits toxic chemical substances when they risk degrading sensitive habitats, coastal water quality, or harm wildlife. The amendment emphasizes prioritizing non-poisonous techniques, allowing herbicides with natural biodegradable compounds as a last resort. Unfortunately, the present habitat restoration plans mandate chemical pesticides. Contrary to these principles, Star Ranch, a 4,000 acre natural Audubon Society preserve has successfully tackled invasive species without herbicides. Pesticides pose risks to non-target species, soil organisms, ecosystems, including water resources. Countless subterranean species filter our water, recycle nutrients, and regulate temperature. Herbicides harm health, especially children, associated with Parkinson's disease, asthma, thyroid issues, depression, anxiety, ADHD, and cancer. Using chemical pesticides due to lack of manpower or increased costs is unacceptable. Environmental and health consequences must be prioritized. Let's protect ecosystems instead of poisoning them. Our collective effort is crucial in preserving a sustainable and thriving environment for future generations. I urge you to consider allocating resources towards promoting and implementing pesticide-free practices, supporting research and education, fostering par partnership for innovative solutions and engaging local communities in conservation initiatives. Together, we can ensure a greener, healthier and safer world where nature flourishes and residents thrive in harmony with the environment. Thank you. There are no more raised hands. Great, thank you. Um, so for the board, uh, just as a point of information, um, for future board meetings, I'd like to add an agenda item that are items for discussion by board members or any potential future agenda items um, as a way to uh, be able to, you know, again, address maybe any concerns, issues that the board would like to either hear more about from staff or just to have a discussion within the board. So um, it's not on 
this uh, agenda, but I just wanted to bring it up for uh, your information. And so um, as we look to our August meeting, again, just wanting to point that out. Um, as this is my uh, first meeting as chair of the board, I also want to recognize uh, that this is Rebecca's first meeting as executive director. So welcome, welcome. So I'm going to hand it off now to Rebecca to walk us through the funding status. Thank you. Um, and if you stick around, there's a little treat about John Donnelly at the end of the meeting. So we do want to make note of that. Um, okay, so for item number three, public funding status informational, you each uh, board agenda, we do have all of our status of all of our fund sources on pages two and three of the full agenda. So that information is there. We are doing, I think, very well at spending all, some general fund funding that we have received. Um, and are continuing to work very hard to get that money out doing great things on the ground. Uh, I have been also asked to just do a quick update on our May revise, which is the, the current budget process. So uh, one piece of good news in the May revise was that we had originally been drafted to lose $40 million for San Joaquin floodplain work. Um, and in the May revise that actually reappeared. So that's exciting. We still are, um, potentially not going to be able to use uh, $79 million for upper watershed work, another $79 million for uh, Southern California watershed work. Those they call um, remaining in the trigger. So it's kind of subject to the economic conditions this, the rest of this year. But then looking forward to the 23-24 budget, if the sub, if it, you know, subject to budget enactment, we could receive $16 million for upper watershed work, $16 million for Southern California watershed work, and the third year of our climate resilience package, which would be $65 million that was reduced from an original $100 amount. So that is exciting. So there's a potential. This is all still subject to negotiation over the next couple of months, but a potential for WCB to get $97 million in the 23-24 budget year. And with that, I'll ask, uh, answer any questions from the board. Any questions or comments from the board? I, I had uh, one question just because... Um, I'm curious about this. Are any of these proposition related dollars or general fund dollars have any um, deadlines on expenditure or it goes, it gets swept? Yes, ab absolutely. Well, there's, so each time the budget year is enacted, it's for example, for our general fund dollars, they put a, a spending limit on that. It's usually a three year to encumber and two year to expend. And it actually varies. It could be two years and two years. It, it varies depending on the budget year. So yes, for those um, dollars, there is a, a limit to the timing that we need to spend those within. The bond funds also have that same limit, but they're easier to reallocate. So we go through of the budget process to try to get those back into our budget um, in subsequent years. So we do that on a regular basis as well. Um, and then also some of the older bonds are actually phasing out. So we also keep track of those timelines. Because the money is being... Because, yeah, they finally have just said, okay, we're going to close out, say, Prop 12, and so you have until X day to spend that money, and then that all goes away. So we're tracking that all internally to make sure the money is accessible for as long as possible for us to do projects. Our Prop 40 and 50, two of those yep. would be... Those are still, I mean, they're still around for a number of, a few more years, but we're watching very closely the, the sunset dates for those propositions. Okay. And so, um, sometimes uh, the state's priorities are different than what they were 20 years ago or something like that. And so I, I was wondering uh, how they get encumbered in long term or not expensive. Okay, thank you for that update. Sure. Rebecca, I have one question. Can you can you tell me again um, what the total amount is coming to us now and how much less that is than what we thought it was going to be at the beginning of the year before we had the for 22 23 mm -hmm. it appears that we'll get 158 million dollars less um you know but that still remains subject to conditions for the rest of the fiscal year and then uh how much will we get then hundred and then for 23 24 we're hoping to get 97 million okay thank you Great. Any additional questions? Okay. Thank you. Um, so item number four. So this is actually, I think, a new uh, maybe standing item for our agenda. It's a project closeout presentation. 
uh, Perazzo Meadow, and I'll hand it off to uh, Rebecca to kind of give us context for it. Yeah, we just, you know, each board meeting, we've been doing kind of a little bit of an educational um, piece, I would say. And so for this time around, we actually identified one of our closed projects and asked them to come back and tell us all the great things they did with the money they were provided. And so, uh, board, you should see how you like this. If this is something you want to see more of, this could be part of a future outreach plan just to really celebrate the successes that we have had. So I just want to introduce uh, Scott McFarland, which will introduce the project proponent to talk about this project. Good morning. So we picked this project because it recently closed out. So we have a lot of fresh information, but it's also something we helped acquire the property in the past. So we thought it was a good tie-in. So in November of 20, 2008, WCB provided $765,000 out of the Habitat Conservation Fund towards a $3.7 million purchase price, partnering with State Water Resources Quality Control Board, the Resources Agency, and Caltrans to provide a grant to the Truckee Donner Land Trust to purchase the 982 acres of forest and mountain meadow habitat. And then more recently, on uh, April 4th, 2019, with our Proposition 1 Streamflow Enhancement Funds, uh, WCB provided $1.98 million to a grant to the Truckee River Watershed Council to participate or in partnership with CDFW, the Forest Service, and the Bella Vista Foundation. And then today we have uh, Beth Chrisman, Senior Director of Restoration with the Truckee River Watershed Council, um, to provide you more of a story of the restoration work. So I'll step back and let her take it over. Well, thank you very much for having me here today. This is sort of exciting. I didn't know this was a new thing. So <laughs> hopefully I won't blow it for everybody else. So um, yeah, as uh, Scott said, I'm Beth Christman. I'm the Senior Director of Restoration with the Truckee River Watershed Council. And next slide. Uh, and our mission is pr to protect, restore, and enhance the Truckee River. And we like to say that we, that we do it through implementing projects, influencing policy, and engaging with people. Next slide. This is the uh, watershed that we work in. So the middle Truckee River from the outflow of Lake Tahoe to the California Nevada state line. And uh, Prazo Meadows is that circle in the upper Northwest corner. All right, uh, next slide. To zoom in a little bit more, there's many meadows that make up the Prazo Meadows system. And uh, uh, I'll be talking about the upper meadow, the middle meadow and the lower meadow today. So the upper meadow we restored in 2009. The middle meadow we restored in 2010, and the lower meadow is the meadow we restored in 2019 in partnership with WCB. So long history uh, in this watershed. So uh, yeah, we've been in there a while. All right, next slide. Uh, and just to sum up, yeah, our, the grant that we were provided with uh, helped restore the lower meadow, but importantly, it also helped to continue the monitoring for the upper and the middle meadow as well. So we have this really rich data record, and I'll talk a little bit about that uh, at the end of the presentation here. All right, next slide. All right, so what was the problem? So you, you all have heard this story many times uh, in the upper headwater meadows in the Sierra Nevada. There's a long history of degradation and human use. And so historically, these meadows tended to be, and specifically in the case of Parazzo Meadows, they were multi-threaded braided, braided systems with numerous channels all over the meadow surface, really good groundwater surface water interaction and excellent floodplain access. And so the water could spread out during high flows and then infiltrate into the shallow groundwater system and then feed to the stream channel later in the, in the summer months when the fish and wildlife need that water most and, and people as well. So when these streams are, are channelized, that process unravels and you can find all of these multiple threaded channels into a single incised channel. And you start this process of incision and degradation that, that just throws the whole system out of whack. And so instead of having nice lush, lush meadow grasses and a high groundwater table and get flim plain access, you get conversion like you see in this lower uh, uh, picture on the right where we start converting to upland habitat like sagebrush and drier grasses. So in the case of Lower Parazzo Meadow, the approach we took, we wanted to re-engage that historic channel system that was still present. And we did that by mostly filling up the, the um, existing channel. So it was, it was a big complicated project, but really the net result was to try, to try and restore those historic flow paths. All right, next slide. So I wanna talk a little bit about how well it worked. So 
uh, one of the things we were looking for was that ele elevated groundwater table. And so I can show you graphs from shallow groundwater wells, but it's much more fun to look at a pretty meadow. So the arrow is pointing to the same willow clump out in the meadow. So you can see that there's a really big conversion just in a couple years from a drier habitat to this really lush, wet, sedge-dominated meadow habitat. And this happened during a drought. And uh, these are just seeds that are present in, in the soil. So we didn't have to plant anything. We didn't do anything. We just added water. All right, next slide. Another goal was to increase floodplain access. And we, uh, we quantified that we increased it by over 400%. But really what happened is now the entire meadow surface functions as a floodplain. And so that provides this really important habitat. There's little fish all in there and uh, it helps to, to keep that water in the system longer and help it infiltrate into, into that shallow groundwater um, soils or infiltrate into the, the meadow soils to promote that shallow groundwater table. All right, next slide. And these are what the restored stream channels look like. So instead of that kind of incised ditch that I showed in one of the early slides, these there's now a network of these types of channels all over the meadow system. Okay, next slide. And so since we're the Wildlife Conservation Board here, um, I wanted to share one of our really exciting wildlife successes. So willow flycatcher was one of our focal species. And they're pretty particular about where they like to nest. They like waterfront property. And so we created a whole bunch of this willow thickets in standing water, which they really like to breed in. And we thought it might take five or 10 years for them to recolonize the lower Perazzo meadow. But instead we had them breeding two breeding pairs in our meadow uh, in 2022. So that was a super exciting result. Okay, and then this is the last result slide, next one. Uh, so this one is kind of just a teaser. So. Um, this was funded through the Streamflow Enhancement Project that, um, or uh, program, that our restoration project. So one of the things we wanted to quantify was, are we increasing late season stream flow? So what we did is we took a very sophisticated modeling approach and we used the long-term gauging record that we had from the upper and the middle meadow. And we compared model conditions of what stream flow in the summer months would be without restoration to measured stream flow. And we found a pretty robust result. And so this is the results from the, the middle meadow. And so we're, we're seeing an increase in July through September of hundreds of acre feet. So 100 to 500 acre feet annually of stream flow that's being stored during those flood flow months in those shallow groundwater soils and then moving out into the, the stream channel when we need it most. So super exciting result, I think. Um, all right, next slide. So this is, you know, the end of the Peraza Meadows project, but, um, you know, we, we have a lot of meadows that we're working on and, and a lot of other types of habitat that we're working on in the Truckee River watershed. And one thing that was super special about this project was that ability to take a really long look at, um, at these other meadows and, and, and start to get a longer data record with the lower meadow. And so it's just really inspired us to continue, try to continue this kind of monitoring across our multiple meadows in the Truckee River system. So last slide. With that, I'd just like to say thank you very much. Um, our partners, the Truckee Donner Land Trust and the Forest Service, and of course, all our wonderful funders such as yourself. So that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? Yeah, I just have one quick one. You may have said it in the beginning, but um, what created the ditching in the first place? Yeah, so in the case of Prazo Meadow, it's a very it was a very busy place. So there was dairies, there were railroads, there were um, you know roads. There, who knows what was out there? Um, and so uh, it was people. You know, they they moved the moved the channel to a place where it it would behave itself, and then they could use the other parts of the meadow for grazing. Or there's a hotel out there somewhere. I mean, it's a really long history of um, of degradation, but yeah, it's just easier to use a meadow if you don't have if you don't have a swamp, basically. Yes, thank you. It, it's very good looking work. Yeah, it's... and um, just uh, before you ask again, Rebecca, I think the idea of presenting projects to us is a really good one. Great. I see a lot of head nodding. So yeah. thank you. All right. Thanks. Thank you very much. All right. So we are moving on to consent items. Um, so before I guess we look at a motion, or I think there's one item that we want to pull from the consent. 
Mm -hmm. Agenda item, are there yeah. from board members, are there any items from? I, I'd like consent? to pull item number 18 for okay. discussion, the um, Aliso Creek augmentation, or the Aliso restoration. Yeah, Aliso Creek habitat restoration yeah. and enhancement augmentation. Yeah, go on. Yeah. Any other items for presentation to the board? Okay. So I think at this time, uh, I'll entertain a motion to... I do have some speaker Oh, you do cards. have some speaker cards? Okay. Thank you. So we'll go ahead and so, hand it off to you for the speaker cards. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, I do have a few speaker cards for items that are on consent. Um, so let's see. I'll try to go in order. For number seven, I have a Sharma Gilmore. Would you like to come forward? Yeah, two minutes, please. Hi, um, I'm Sharna Gilmore. I'm the executive director for the Scott River Watershed Council. Um, I just want to, I'm here just to, to show my um, um, appreciation for your consideration for the proposal that we have for Cabin Creek and the Rock Fence um, Watershed Planning Project. Um, as you saw from the previous presentation, this is really critical habitat. This is in the Scott Valley. Um, we believe that these watersheds that we're going to be looking in, at um, support previous investments that the um, Conservation Board has um, provided in the past. Um, as you know, Scott River is a critical system for and a tributary of the Klamath. Um, it supports a, a very robust and hopefully um, improving condition for coho salmon. So these meadows we feel are critical to both um, water quality and quantity and our salmon population. So thank you for your consideration today. Thank you. I also have Bonnie Bennett for number seven, the cabin meadow and rock fence planning project. Hi, my name is Bonnie Bennett and I'm an environmental scientist with Quartz Valley Indian Reservation. We are collaborating with Scott River Watershed Council on the Cabin Meadows Rock Fence Creeks Watershed Planning Project. It is imperative that we restore the uplands of the Scott River headwaters while simultaneously restoring the valley for the sake of the fish and overall ecological recovery of the watershed. Thank you for your support. Thank you. Okay, on item eight, which is State Route 97 Wildlife Migratory Corridor Planning, I've got Nick Jocelyn. From Mount Shasta Bioregional Ecological Center. Is he online, Alexa? Yes, he should be able to unmute himself now. I'm Nick Joslin from the Mount Shasta Bioregional Ecology Center. Just wanted to give our support to consent agenda item eight, recognizing that the costs were increasing. I think it makes a lot of sense to put more money towards this wildlife crossing. It's in a very critical location. And we've been tracking the project since its inception. Also continuing to work with Caltrans to identify other locations suitable for similar projects. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Also have uh, David Webb for the same project number. Thank you. I'm David Webb speaking as an individual today. I also want to support this project. I think uh, it's one where one can always hope that preliminary cost estimates are correct. But uh, when trying to work with new materials, develop better, faster, quicker, and safer approaches, it's not unreasonable to have costs be higher than expected. And I think it's laudable that the Wildlife Conservation Board is going to fund continued investigations here that will ultimately lead to a wildlife crossing in this area. At the same time, in keeping with the Wildlife Conservation Board's strategic vision, of greater proactive involvement. I would really like to see them and staff work with Caltrans to look into adding additional crossings to the south of this project area where Highway 97 is bordered by miles of eight foot high chain link fence. It's clear proof of that area's former broad front usage as a wildlife corridor for, for wildlife moving from the lowlands of the Shasta Valley uh, to the upper areas on the slopes of Mount Shasta in the summertime for later spring forage and summer and forage and water, and then back down to lowlands uh, for the winter as, as Mount Shasta got snowed in. And that has long been cut off and has left us with what was otherwise great usable habitat split into two unusable pieces. So it'd be really nice if we could build on 
this current project for future ones in the same general area. Thank you. Thank you. I don't see any other speaker cards. Alexa, are there any other hands raised? There are no raised hands. I think that's it for the consent. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so I'll entertain a motion to uh, approve consent items 5 through 17, 19, and 20. I'll move to approve consent items 5 through 20, um, except for number 18. I'll second. Great. So now I'm going to open it up for discussion questions. Friend? I had uh, several questions that applied to several things on the consent calendar and one or two in the others. And I just wanted to, for clarification, when I review all these, some I can find in the information and some I can't, and some I just wonder if they're relevant or not. So um, there's something called the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, right? And with severe over drafted basins, medium to severe, 125 of our 515 groundwater basins are uh, severely overdrafted, and people are trying to work at turning that around. The, the partial end of the drought for a short period of time might help, but it takes for a long time to repercolate a, a aquifer. So I was wondering, just out of curiosity for these, or in the future, to put something in if anything on the agenda overlaps a targeted, severely overdrafted basin. For example, I was curious on number eight or 11 or 12 or 16 or 25, they all had to do uh, with uh, restoring watersheds or some had to do with pumping. And I thought it would be just, you know, uh, if it's not in a severely overdrafted basin, I'm not as concerned if they are. Maybe, maybe though it wasn't uh, when you review a project because Sigma's relatively new, it wasn't evaluated. So I didn't see any acknowledgement one way or another during the review, that's all I'm suggesting. And it could be just uh, two, two words somewhere in it, uh, applies, doesn't apply. <laughs> Great. We'll make a note of that for future write-ups. And here's the other last little ones on those. So um, other curiosity question, are you exempted from CEQA if you use herbicides in a watershed or groundwater basin or in any case? Is that evaluated under CEQA? I Might couldn't answer that. that. I have a degree in planning and I could not answer that, but I was just curious yeah. because these uh, reason I bring it up, that might not have been something that was on those checkoff lists when people evaluate projects, correct? Yeah, it might. From 20 years ago, maybe it's more relevant now. I just curious. So it, if it's not relevant, fine. I can, I just want to leave that out there for staff to sort of, Think about. I, I don't if, want you to be legally challenged. Oh no! I wonder if yeah. I mean, we do CEQA so. based on the potential environmental impacts of any project. So if, if that's one of those, I think it's yeah. evaluate. I mean, I, I guess I would turn it around. It's you know a project of CEQA if it's required. Well, if it's minimal, uh, but that's somewhat subjective. I, I I don't think looking at the um, EIR <laughs> or the CEQA document that was presented with, uh, I think it's number 24, it doesn't look like um, herbicides are part of the evaluation. And I don't know that that has routinely been part of a CEQA evaluation. I think, Fran, you might be right. It might have been something that, yes. that hasn't been so brought. Yeah. And it hasn't been brought. Nobody's challenged that in courts, but maybe Colin knows. And I'm not trying to you know, make attorneys wealthy or anything <laughs> like that. But I was just curious if that was something that was reviewed yeah. just like yeah. the other one is that do you have any if not um it's something sure. to um a, a few things yeah. obviously <clears throat> we our legal team we review every project that comes forward to us for compliance with CEQA um in the case I I believe Catherine was mentioning there was an EIR on a project 
as a responsible agency, so not the lead agency, we're, we're not the one preparing the EIR in that. CEQA posits that as a responsible agency, that the EIR is presumed to be correct in that instance. And as a responsible agency, we don't have the ability to go back and second guess that lead agency's opinion, which we've discussed before, because because we've had this conversation. So, you know, um, the whenever a lead agency is reviewing a project, they they have to review it for significant environmental impacts by the project. Um, uh, there are applicable statutory and categorical exemptions that apply in some cases. If they don't, obviously you get into a negative declaration, mitigate, mitigated negative declaration EIR position, right? Where they try to mitigate the impacts caused by that project. Sometimes they can't, in which case lead agencies will adopt a statement of over overriding consideration. I mean, in, in our case, again, as a responsible agency, these lead agency determinations have not been challenged. That's why we're bringing these, these forward to you. WCB in the past also has not been challenged with respect to our secret compliance on these projects. So it would probably take a third party to challenge the applicant or to challenge the lead agency and say, you haven't taken into consideration the effects and the potential mitigation for herbicide use. If somebody wanted to challenge it, yeah, they, okay. they would have to sue the lead agency with respect to the adequacy Which of I'm the, not, the environmental I'm document. not encouraging. So I, I'm, I'm just curious how you were handling it because I get the lead agency thing, Correct. but there's one item on the agenda. There's no lead agency. I think it's that, I think it's that uh, project with all the pollinators and the monarchs because they're in multi-counties and you don't know which county, maybe there's no specific project yet underneath, but it says in the write-up, uh, there's no lead agency. Is is that the block grant proposal? It could be. So so in the block grant- It's not a real project yet. It's well, in the, in the block grant um, projects, what we're doing is we're doing a government fiscal action, right? We're, we're giving a pot of money to a grantee to then go out and implement individual projects. And what our grant says in those instances is before our grantee can subgrant those funds out for individual projects, they have to ensure that adequate CEQA compliance has occurred. Um, so oftentimes they might be working with resource conservation districts or, or other local agencies that are then doing the environmental review for those projects. And our grant goes even further to say that if there is no lead agency identified for an individual project under a block grant, that they then need to come back to WCB so that we can do whatever CEQA is necessary. If it falls outside of an exemption, so it would need some sort of environmental review that's not covered by a statutory or categorical exemption on the block grant project, right? those projects could not then move forward in that case because we don't have the authority to do something more than an exemption in those cases unless we brought it back to you. So if right. a significant impact. Correct. We can't grant an exemption. Okay. I'll finish with my last two things. I was just curious on the um, uh, at least four items. The support was also from nature-based solutions is that just as is that a monetary support or is it um just um uh support because they're in favor of the project in general are you talking about the funding source being nature-based yeah, solutions yeah. yeah so so there are general funding we kind of categorize in different pots and that's what you'll see at the beginning of the description and so when you see the description as nature-based solution that is specifically uh, talking about the $150 million we got under general fund funding for nature-based solutions. And that is the pot where 40% of that pot will go to either um, underserved communities, climate vulnerable communities, or tribes. So um, that's where the, that pot is. And nature-based solutions is part uh, coordinated with the 3030. Yeah, as, as far as implementing, implementing the 30 by 30 program, you know, that's part of that. Top of your head, whether it's also um, 
will be counting towards carbon capture and storage? That depends if those different applicants are tracking that. It's not a requirement of that funding in specifically, yeah. but. but uh, yeah. Okay. That's a whole different sure. uh, a problem and challenge. And um, my last thing that would be helpful to me when you do your reviews, because um, sometimes I can find it easily and it may be just uh, different people that do projects in different ways by staff to some extent or emphasize things. But I'm always curious about who is the short term, but more specifically the long term entity that's going to own and maintain the property. Sure, and we highlight yeah, some, that under our management yeah. section. Yeah, correct. Um, but if it's just a short term, or you know, some is to hold it through escrow, and then it'll go into someone. And I see, right. oh, that's a legitimate foundation or agency that can handle it. And then others, I'm sort of left pondering. Okay, uh, this could be tribal, and it could be because of this huge influx of general fund money. Maybe it's not all been completely ironed out yet. I don't yeah, know. But it's helpful if you just short term longer or who operates and maintain it because I was around during the dime of the last budget nightmare uh, in the early 2000s. Sure. And all a lot of the agencies got overextended in having to put in any money they had for operation and maintenance. And they frankly didn't have the staff anymore because they were cut back and they couldn't maintain it. So I that long-term operation and maintenance on all these, uh, this great acquisition and, and projects. Um, if, if it's settled and who's going to do that, that should be put out. Or even if it's CDFW will for the next three years and then we'll be passing it. Just so great. We'll make sure folks highlight yeah, that in their that presentation. All sure. right, that's it, thank you. I, I have one question, and that is, um, I don't have a problem with the augmentation for the overcrossing on 97, but I, I am concerned that there's this anticipation that there's going to be and is an increasing amount of truck traffic on a road that really isn't designed for that kind of truck traffic. And what we're having then is this conflict with um, wildlife. Has there been any effort to have a conversation with Caltrans or is there a working group to see if there might be a way of limiting truck traffic um, or or redirecting truck traffic back to the to the five or something like that? Yeah, agencies have been actively working with Caltrans and I think Chuck has maybe the latest on that. Great question, Catherine. And there are several things underway as you know we have recent legislation that identifies the need to list priorities each year for crossing and wildlife conflict uh, mitigation that instructs caltrans and the department of fish and wildlife to do that annual engagement secondly maybe three months ago our department produced an update of an earlier, I think, 2020 document that identifies about 60 priorities around the state in identified in each region of the most important connectivity problems to fix. And then currently our department has a funding stream for wildlife crossing projects, as does WCB. Those are, of course, general, and you're asking about traffic on 97 on the west side of I-5. Yeah, where some redirect. of these conflicts are occurring, and it, and it each time it's been presented to us, it sounds like there's an increasing amount well, of truck traffic. 97 is one of the few routes from kind of inland to the coast, so it's a well-used state route. And I don't know if the Wildlife Conservation Board really has the jurisdictional reach yeah. for like traffic, but the department is certainly active with Caltrans on where we see to be the biggest problems between vehicle and wildlife conflicts. 
This is one of them. Yeah, and um, I wouldn't suggest that we do have any jurisdiction, but there might be some sort of softer um, ability to have substantial conversations with Caltrans because there's actually sort of a generational change going on over in Caltrans leadership. And um, I've seen some some young enviros go in and take some new responsibility for things like sustainable freight, et cetera. And there might be an opportunity to start informal conversations with them to avoid what's going to be certainly a future clash if in fact the, you know, our our crossings don't work as well as they should because the traffic is just getting bigger and bigger uh, truck traffic. Because it, I mean, one of the, the facts of life is that truckers often drive at night and that makes it even harder um, to control the conflicts with the wildlife. Julie noted. All right, thank you for your comments, questions. Any other additional comments or questions? Okay, so um, I think just one, uh, uh, Fran, your your question on the general fund, the nature-based solutions. I think one of the things we might think about is maybe even listing some of the, the categories that make up that general fund to just kind of remind us all where that money's coming from. And, and as at the last board meeting, um, the board also did adopt under nature-based solutions, the funding pot, the 40% of uh, the additional criteria around kind of the equity um, piece, just as a reminder. So, all right. So with that, uh, I have a first and a second. Can we take a roll call vote, please, Mary? Chair Bukke. Aye. Vice Chair Bonham. Board Member Nagami. Board Member Pavley? Yes. Board Member Peralt? Yes. Board Member Phillips? Yes. Board Member Scalar? Yes. Okay, motion passes. Um, so now we'll move on to item 18, Rebecca. Okay, so let's have, uh, we're going to talk now about the Aliso Creek Habitat Restoration and Enhancement Augmentation and to present that from staff will be Don Crocker. Uh, thank you, Rebecca. This proposal is to consider the allocation for an augmentation to a grant to the Laguna Canyon Foundation for a cooperative project with the Warren Family Charitable Foundation, Orange County Parks and Recreation Department, and the city of Aliso Viejo to restore approximately 21 acres of riparian and coastal sage scrub habitat that will increase breeding and nesting habitat for the least bells vireo and southwestern pond turtle in Orange County. Uh, next slide, please. Aliso and Wood Canyon's Wilderness Park in Orange County is shown in dark green on the map in the upper left corner. It lies near the Laguna Coast Wilderness Park and Crystal Coast State Park and covers over 4,500 acres that are mostly coastal sage scrub, oak woodland, and riparian habitat. The project area is an extension of the park's northeastern boundary along Aliso Creek, which is shown in the map in the upper right. The project site is surrounded by housing and other urban development, but as you can see from the bottom photograph, the area has been maintained as a significant open space. The riparian corridor along Aliso Creek within the project area has definitely been impacted by the introdu introduction of non-native plant species, but still maintains some of its natural character. The upland habitat surrounding this corridor, however, has been much more disturbed and is almost completely dominated by invasive vegetation. Uh, next slide, please. The pictures on this slide show the extent of the non-native plant establishment in the upland areas. There are a number of uh, invasive species present in this area, but black mustard, artichoke thistle, and non-native grasses are some of the most prevalent. Next slide, please. In February 2020, the board approved the original project with the intent to restore or enhance 21 acres of riparian and upland habitat. Unfortunately, the project suffered significant setbacks. The first was the COVID lockdown, which stopped all field work soon after the project was approved. This prevented the removal of invasive plants and more crucially, delayed the suppression of the non-native plant seed bank in the soil. And when they were finally allowed back in the field, they were faced with a severe drought in 2021 and 2022. This led to a high mortality rate for the installed container plants and decreased the effectiveness of hydro seeding. Since then, the project has regained its footing. The picture on the right is from when I visited the site last fall. The removal of the invasive species has gone well, and you can see several of the container plants that were installed. 
The issue is that at this point of the project, those plants should be much larger and gradually losing their dependence on irrigation. They're growing well, but they would not be able to establish themselves in the face of competition from invasive species without supplemental water. This is why the grantee has asked the WCB for an augmentation and a 15 month extension. This will allow for remedial planning in areas where installed container plants and hydro seeding failed to establish, supplemental watering of any new or previously installed container stock, and a continuation of weed management that will prevent non-natives from crowding out the installed plants and keep the non-native plant seed bank suppressed. Next slide, please. Even though this project has faced some setbacks, it's going well now, and a time extension and additional funding would help ensure the project reaches its original goal of restoring 8.5 acres of riparian habitat and 12.5 acres of coastal sage scrub. These are two critical habitats that have a high level of biodiversity and are home to many sensitive species, with two of the most critical being the southwestern pond turtle, which is a species of special concern, and the endangered least bells vireo. The project will also improve climate change resiliency by providing refuge for wildlife whose range has shrunk due to changes in future weather patterns, and it will enhance the wildlife border between protected areas in Orange County. Therefore, staff recommends the augmentation be approved as proposed. In the audience is Hallie Jones, Executive Director of the Laguna Canyon Foundation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll open it up to any questions, comments for the report. Okay. So I think we've got some. Uh, Yes, and I did want to just for the record highlight some letters that came in late. Um, so we, and these have all been forwarded to the board, but we did get letters in opposition from Kim Conte from Non Toxic Neighborhoods, Kian Shulman, Shulman, excuse me, from Poison Free Malibu, uh, Brian Lee from NTN Youth California, Non Toxic OC Parks, Darius Fadapahor from uh, Bonzal, California, Rana Azimi, Rita. Coop Roop, excuse me, Megan Kahn, uh, Sonoma County Climate Activist Network, Susan Tritek, and Kevin Lean. Okay, and then I do have some speaker cards that were submitted. So we'll go first with uh, David Webb. David, you should be able to unmute yourself. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, again, speaking as an individual. Uh, this is another good project, and it's great to see continued Wildlife Conservation Board support for, for this sort of work. But it's also one that is reliant on significant herbicide usage with a, no apparent exit strategy, and at least in summary. Um, reliance on herbicides ahead of any other means of, of control of invasives really puts me in mind of the words of Winston Churchill in 1940, where he said, you can count on the Americans to do what's right, but only they have, after they have tried everything else. And here, all non-chemical approaches are definitely taking a back seat to everything else. Uh, reading towards the end of the questionnaire, it's, it's clear that the proponents went into this project with a strong herbicide background and consequently mindset and not one likely to be looking aggressively for ways to develop alternatives that might work instead of the herbicides. The glyphosate presentation to the Wildlife Conservation Board last meeting really should be fully integrated into, into everyone's thinking. Herbicides are not simply a low cost approach to a desired end. The long-term and hidden costs are easily overlooked or passed on to others. Uh, and then the Wildlife Conservation Board is in an excellent position to help pioneer ways towards less toxic environment on this and other projects. With that in mind, I'm wondering if the Wildlife Conservation Board might consider delaying some implementation on this project while requesting the project proponents include some sort of training or partnership with perhaps the Audubon Star Ranch, also located in Orange County, not far away near Santa Margarita where many invasives are being successfully controlled without herbicides, or perhaps the Wildlife Conservation Board could request the management plan include setting aside an annually increasing percentage of the total area where herbicides will no longer be used to encourage the investigation and experimentation that will be needed to develop site-specific management approaches. I think we all know that without sufficient nudges and support, 
doing those investigations and developing those site-specific approaches simply won't happen. And we never will finally get to doing what's right. So give that some thought if you would, and thank you very much. Thank you. It's a little hard for us to hear up here, Alexa. I don't know if there's a way to increase the volume for the speakers, but let's go to the next one. And also please make sure the timer is showing on our screen. So let's try uh, Kian Schulman, please, next. Two minutes. Kian, you should be able to unmute yourself. Okay. Yes, sorry. Um, yes, I'm Kian Shulman, Director of Boards in Pre-Malibu. Uh, my uh, comments are the same that I, I expressed at the beginning of the meeting. Please do not allow toxic chemical pesticides to be used on any project. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next I have Amber Jameson. Hi, my name is Amber Jamison, and I work with Environmental Protection Information Center. Um, I'd like to echo the last two speakers. Um, I have concerns that this project is reliant on significant herbicide use and doesn't have any strategy or timeline to phase out or stop using these carcinogenic herbicides. Um, I'd like to see non-chemical approaches being utilized without the use of herbicides and request that the Wildlife Conservation Board delay implementation to explore alternatives to controlling invasives without the use of herbicides. I think it's concerning that one of the main purposes of this project is to restore riparian areas, and in those areas are um, in, endangered species. And the, pro the project area includes federally listed endangered species species, the least Bells Bureau, and regionally important southwestern pond turtle. Um, the EPA has determined that glyphosate is likely to adversely affect the least Bells Bureau, and this project includes the Aliso Creek floodplain along the east-facing slopes between the creek and Aliso Parkway, and describes herbicides as the primary weed management tool, which is concerning. The project proposes use of diquat dibromolide, which is also considered highly toxic to aquatic invertebrates. I request the Wildlife Conservation Board impose restrictions on herbicide use in any floodplain or near riparian areas and mandate a, a plan to move away from the use of herbicides for any projects that get public funding or on public land. Thank you very much. Thank you. Alexa, do we have other hands raised? There is one additional hand raised. Um, Doug Johnson, you should be able to unmute yourself. Great. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, again, Doug Johnson with the California Invasive Plant Council. We're an environmental group which does support the use of herbicides as an important tool for restoration. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it would be um, very useful to hear from the project about the mix of uh, integrated pest management methods they're using, because I would assume it's not just herbicides. Um, to hear about the amount of herbicide, the duration of the usage that's expected, um, and the uh, practices are, uh, in proximity to water, because all of those are things that uh, land managers consider. And I would assume the ecologists who are promoting the um, restoration of habitat for the southwestern pond turtle and south, uh, at least Bells Vireo, um, are in support of this habitat restoration. I did want to mention, um, I sent a memo to the board last week, which hopefully you've had a chance to read, but the US EPA's biological evaluation um, evaluates whether glyphosate could cause problems for species, not whether they are causing those problems in the real world. As I mentioned in my memo, this is comparable to Prop 65, which tells us in California which things could cause cancer. And we're all used to seeing Prop 65 warnings in surprising places. Uh, my personal favorite was at the Carmel Apple booth at the Santa Cruz Beach and Boardwalk. Um, it's unfortunate that EPA's terminology and their biological evaluation leads to so much confusion, making it sound like glyphosate is having impacts on listed species rather than that it could have in impacts, for instance, if directly applied and if a lot of it was eaten on um, contaminated vegetation. We await the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's assessment of real-world risks to list listed species. 
Um, we do know that glyphosate can be extremely useful in protecting listed species in their habitat. Glyphosate may be overused in agriculture, but it's important to distinguish the small targeted uses of glyphosate for restoration um, from massive agricultural uses. Thanks. Thank you. Any others, Alexa? There are no additional raised hands. Okay, thank you for the comments. Are there any questions uh, from the board? Yeah, um, I don't get the impression from the board from the the questionnaire that the applicant filled out that there has been a significant effort to identify alternatives using herbicides. Maybe the applicant can comment on that. Hi there, Hallie Jones, Executive Director of Laguna Canyon Foundation. Um, we are using multiple methods of weed control on this project. We are hand pulling, we are mowing, and we are using herbicides, synthetic herbicides. Um, we work in partnership with many other organizations, including the California Invasive Plant Council, to make sure that we are keeping up on the latest um, restoration ecology science, um, what is being shown to be working in um, these restoration environments, and um, the eff efficacy of um, different kinds of weed management. Um, I noticed the reference to some fairly old papers and no reference to fairly new papers about the impacts of glyphosate, for instance, on wildlife. And um, over time, I've been putting together a, and offer this up to you, it's got, um, it's, it's got some references to more contemporary papers Thank with you. their abstracts. And I'll send you a copy of that, Mary, so that you have it for the record. Thank you. You can have that and grab it. Um, additionally, um, I just want to comment that there are other places, and somebody mentioned it earlier, uh, Star Ranch that has for a number of decades um, had a policy of not using any kind of uh, herbicide, pesticide. And one of the things they've done is... Um, is actually do studies using their own land as studies to see how often do you have to mow, what's the time frame, and we'll hear more about that. I I hope in um, in August, but I think this is the kind of project that would and the kind of project applicant that would benefit from um, being asked to uh, do more work with some entity that is committed to not using herbicides in a similar situation as in they're having to deal with or had to deal with, at least when they started, a lot of invasives and figure out how to get away from them. I wonder if we could put up the map of where this project is to, again, it was on the slides. Um, there it is, uh, back, back. Uh, not actually the map, but the overview. There you go. So it, it looks to me like this project is, or the, the area, the general watershed is, um, it looks like there's some neighborhoods or a school or a park. I can't tell because there, there's either a, a track or a, something else next to it. But this is in a, an area with a lot of people. And I don't know a lot about the um, the the effects of of um, herbicide overspray. I don't know much about how it gets into the atmosphere. But these are things that when because I do have a background in air pollution stuff, when I look at this, I kind of start worrying about it. And I'm also then wondering, well, some people have already testified that there's a longer um, there's a longer period of persistence of glyphosate in the soil than than Monsanto or Bayer have said in the past. Um, it doesn't always go up to 22 years. Sometimes it's a year, sometimes it's three years. It depends on the type of soil. I also wonder, you know, what what's the 
the length of time that this is going to stay in the soil, these pesticides. And I do that because I know when I was growing up as a kid, when there was any kind of wildland area, and we had a canyon behind my house that was probably loaded with stuff I shouldn't have been near, um, that was where we went to play. And I worry about, even though it seems like it may be, you know, as you're thinking about restoration, it may be not a big impact on humans. I worry about what the impact is going to be if there is a persistence in this soil. And I don't know that anybody is monitoring or testing what the persistence is in this case, and whether we do have to be concerned about kids who go down there um, and, you know, mess around in the soil while they're chasing lizards or whatever. Um, so for me, I would prefer, I, I have nothing, I think all of us agree that the overall goal of this project is good, but I would prefer to see an alternative approach that while it may cost more and it may take more time, would not rely on using herbicides. Thank you, Chair. Hi, Hallie, good to see you. Thanks for being here. Um, there have been suggestions to delay the project. Could you, um, what would what would a delay, um, what kind of impact would a delay have on the project? To be very frank, the reason that we're here asking for this augmentation is because of the delay caused by COVID. So when you talk about delaying weed treatment specifically, and the care and feeding of these native plants that we've put in the ground, um, you're talking about uh, an ecological delay of years. You get you know, a field of mustard that goes to seed, all of a sudden you've got seven more years of seed bank. So um, the, the idea of delaying the project um, would have extreme consequences on the overall success. Okay, thanks. Um, so this board, we're, we've asked for, and I think we're going to hear more about examples of folks, for example, Star Ranch in Orange County, who have had success with uh, not using herbicides. Would you be, would you and the foundation be open to having more discussion and sort of, um, uh, participating as in discussions going forward, uh, just as generally, ad, like separate from this project? Sure. So we um, actually have a meeting scheduled with our restoration staff and Star Ranch. Um, we know them well. We have a lot of respect for the work that, that Pete and Sandy are doing. Um, I think what's really critical here is that um, herbicide is a tool in the toolbox. Um, and in order to accomplish ecological restoration on the scale and in the time frame that we're talking about here, it's a very important tool. It's not the only tool, which is why we do use hand pulling and mowing. I, I don't want to lose sight of the fact that invasive species are the greatest threat to our endangered habitats um, behind development. That's really important for us all to remember. We're here to protect endangered species and restore habitat, just like the Wildlife Conservation Board is. And this is a very important tool to get there. The other thing that I think is important to note is um, uh, there are best management practices in place to make sure that we're avoiding things like overspray, to make sure that we are buffering trails, things like that, to limit, limit human exposure. Um, I think making sure that all of those BMPs are in place, that we have highly trained staff um, out there who know what they're doing and who can um, use these chemicals carefully and appropriately is really important to note. Chair, if I might. Yes, please, please. I think I have a question in here, but first I just wanted to acknowledge some of our participants today may be coming to this topic for the first time because they haven't been at the board recently. Others participating may be realizing the board's been having an ongoing conversation about this topic more broadly. 
Personally, I think the board has made a difference already because the board has revisited its decision making in this space. It has made clear instruction to our staff to treat the topic differently. That treatment, I would presume, has had a ripple effect across the applicant pool. Applicants now are aware the due diligence standard will be treated differently and that the board cares deeply about a diverse toolkit, but things that are tools in that kit being placed as a measure of last resort after you incentivize other options first. I trust our SCAF to deliver that conversation, those requirements and that expectation with prospective applicants. And by the time a proposal gets here, it's important for each board member to express their views. That's our job. It informs decision-making. But Chair, I'd also say I'm to the spot where I feel like we're having the same conversation. And I think perhaps as a board, we need to think about when we come to this topic, um, can we just reference prior remarks generally and move to motion? Um, thank you. I, I do know one of the things that uh, I guess I'd like to throw out for discussion with the board, but uh, which is related, but, you know, I think it kind of addresses the, the I think, ongoing uh, conversation education that the board has been, um, you know, hearing when it comes to herbicides and glyphosate. Um, I mean, one recommendation I have, there has been work done and want to acknowledge, I think, the staff's work on the questionnaire and the engagement with the applicant, uh, again, to look at the diversity of what's in the toolbox. Um, so, but I think that we need to maybe go a step further from the questionnaire and work with staff uh, to look at, you know, what are some models, uh, because I, I am that we may want to, you know, that we can use as a framework to think about the recommendations so that we're, we can, you know, kind of come to the, the meetings, I think, with uh, at least greater consensus within the board about advancing uh, projects that include, you know, potentially include herbicide. And so one of the things I'd like to just see if there is any interest from the board in establishing a, a subcommittee, maybe a member of two uh, board members to work with Rebecca and staff to, um, you know, look at the questionnaire, look at the research that's been done and come back to the board with maybe some uh, additional recommendations when it comes to the herbicide question so that we can have, I think, uh, some better, you know, uh, I guess, agreement and consensus on how we're going to address so, the issue. Yeah. So any any reactions, yes. response to yes. that? Um, this issue is going to keep coming up over and over as long as staff continues to bring us projects that contain, that use herbicides, but specifically glyphosate. I think there's, a, in my mind, glyphosate is a particular case and we should not be providing any funding for glyphosate. Um, the state of New York has passed a law that requires a ban on the use of glyphosate in any public projects with some exceptions. And in those exceptions, one of those includes restoration if you're gonna do restoration and it's gonna use glyphosate, you have to um, consider alternatives. You have to um, do a fairly significant plan on how you're gonna use it, how often you're gonna use it. And then you have to keep tabs on exactly how much you use. And then at the end of the year, you know, the state itself, puts out a document that says, this is how many pounds of glyphosate were used by um, the Department of Transportation and then the their natural resources agency equivalent, et cetera, et cetera. We don't do any of that in California. And that's sort of part of the problem is this stuff is just being spread like crazy. 
we could, I, I see the value of doing a subcommittee if it means coming back with some recommendations, because we don't need legislation to require that applicants do X, Y, and Z, have to jump over some hoops, um, have to be aware of what the you know most recent research is. And no offense to any of the applicants, I know that a lot of you are relying on, on people who their profession is to you know, apply these herbicides. It's not like you've been an herbicide applier in your life. And so how do we make sure that this, the self-interests of the companies that apply the herbicides are not driving this and instead the best interests of wildlife and habitat and public health is driving it. So I would be happy to serve on a subcommittee, but um, with all due respect, Chuck, this thing's going to keep coming back as long as the staff continues to bring glyphosate issues here. Yeah, Chair, if I might, I'm comfortable with a subcommittee so long as the board is also comfortable with majority minority vote. If the okay, subcommittee's correct. purpose is to shrink the risk and preclude the use, I'm not comfortable with that assignment. I'm not pro glyphosate. I am pro restoration. I agree that the subcommittee's charter could be, is there a next step of rigor analysis, comparative filtering we want to deploy with our community and our partners? I'm, I would welcome kind of a, a next possible iteration of, I don't know what the right word would be, uh, filter, checklist, scrutiny. But if our expectation today is um, we need to find an outcome where the board is always unanimously rejecting the possibility of the application, I think that's a, a kind of a troubling expectation to head into a subcommittee with. Um, I, in, in that case, I don't see the value of the subcommittee either because I just don't see that um, that unless the subcommittee is establishing a way to stop using glyphosate or reduce it dramatically or send a signal to staff to not bring those projects forward, I don't see that the subcommittee will be effective in what our long-term goal is, which is to, uh, to ensure that we're as safely as possible um, protecting wildlife and habitat. And if there is restoration to be done, that it's being done in the safest way possible with as many bounds as possible to ensure that that safe um, restoration is occurring. And finally, you know, we've never gotten any kind of, of response back from council about the informal conversations with um, the AG's office. This is probably not the place to do it, but at some point at a future meeting, we should probably have a, a conversation about that. Yeah, I understand. Just, uh, Catherine, can I just ask a clarifying question? So you, you raised, for example, the the New York example of more rigor in um, a more rigorous plan, more rigorous oversight, tracking the amount of glyphosate. Um, so is that kind of, I mean, that's kind of what Chuck is seem to be getting at is like the next step of rigor in a screening process here. If yeah, that but came the out next step of, of rigor is not is not just another another iteration of the of the questionnaire. And frankly, I think I'm getting lots of information from the questionnaire, and it's just making me more and more anxious. So <laughs> I don't know what more they could put in the questionnaire that's not going to make me more anxious. But we, I think, we have to come up with some real. Um, wildlife conservation board policies and they that that are more reflective of something like what we're seeing in New York and we don't need legislation for that I'm open. and I think a subcommittee can get to that outcome I just don't want to foreclose the possibility of the tool after that additional rigor so um, 
just a additional comment. So I do think that there I'm hearing, uh, you know, in this discussion that there is value in looking at, um, you know, we've heard some of the speakers talk about models out there that uh, maybe we could look at to apply for some of the WCB projects. Um, so I do think that there is, in terms of thinking about policy level work, looking at some of the models and what some of the potential um, best practices might be for the board to consider. Uh, I don't think there is uh, I'll have to, you know, may work with uh, between now and the next board meeting, maybe have a deeper discussion with Rebecca and, you know, Colin to come back potentially with a framework on some of the other, you know, kind of key issues on how the board might approach that. So I think, um, you know, at this point, my recommendation to the board, if there's support, is to establish a subcommittee to look at if there is additional rigor. Um, and, you know, we've had the questionnaire for how long now? Six, eight months? Maybe there is a refresh of the questionnaire. I mean, Catherine, if you're saying, you know, I mean, so I'm not, I'm not trying to just kind of throw everything into the subcommittee, but I think that there now that we've had this tool out there, maybe this is where the questionnaire still becomes kind of that tool or template to be able to look at some additional rigor for um, and tracking, uh, which I think are some of the components of the model in New York that you mentioned. But I think we're going to uh, both in looking at the information and having those conversations, developing kind of this additional rigor, but then I think we're gonna to have to think about what what is the you know role and kind of potential next step of the board in thinking, you know, which what I'm hearing is uh, you know, maybe a policy related to the use of glyphosate or herbicide. So I think we have to, you know, I think we need to need more time to dialogue on that so okay with that is there so I want to get to a motion on this uh from the board but is there support and any volunteers to I know Catherine said she I, I think don't want to speak for you that yes. you would sit on the subcommittee yes. any other members interested <laughs> Interesting might not be the right word. But. Or uh, available. <laughs> so it would be also it also would be helpful to have a, a lawyer on there, Damon. We remind me our subcommittees can't be larger than. I think three, right? No Is that three? Yeah. I'll. I'll Subject to calendaring, I'll be glad to join the subcommittee. Okay, thank you, Chuck. Um, is Eric? Eric, I just want to make sure, please. Uh, I know you've joined us virtually. Please uh, raise your hand or let us know if you'd like to uh, jump in on the conversation. So. Thank you. I appreciate it. I can't serve on it at this point, but uh, okay. you know, I'm comfortable with, with the subcommittee bringing back a number of options, having a kind of a, a discussion about those options and the commission and the um, the board deciding what the policy is going forward rather than having kind of a, a discussion on it on each item that it comes up with. I think that would be both uh, effective and, and important. Um, but again, it has to be by, you know, uh, majority support. Agreed. Yeah. Sure. Okay. With that, can I oh, ask a clarifying question? Okay. So, I, Wait, please. yeah, yes, I understand. I, I'm interested in joining the subcommittee. Um, are we going to have like a dedicated portion of each meeting to sort of report on what we're working on? So, yes, this rather is than the yes, it'd be good to get through all it, the items. It would be yes, agreed, and and I think this was part of at the onset of the meeting wanting to have a an agenda item that is specifically for the board, both to bring up items, but I think a good place for us to have the discussions on any of the work that's happening at a subcommittee level and be able to do that kind of up front of the meeting. Yeah, so that if there are, you know, any kind of next steps, it won't maybe 
and go through every project. So that's the plan. And if hope. we, if Damon, it would be lovely to have both you and Chuck, and that would give us four. And the only difference is that we'd have to notice the meeting, right? 72 hours in advance. If, if, if you want a subcommittee that is um, over three members, then you have to comply with Bagley Keene, and those have to be open to the yeah, public. just three. There's just three. three. There's only three. Oh, Chuck, yeah. Chuck dropped that. Off. Yeah, I, I heard that Chuck it was just th David. three. Oh, I thought Damon said he was interested. Sorry. Yeah, sure. It's That's you, Chuck, and Damon. That's three. That's three. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, got it. That's yeah. perfect. Okay, thanks. So I think we're okay. But yeah, no, but good clarification. And I, I have one question of the applicant before we vote. Okay. Did did you say that you have met with um, the Star Ranch folks? or We have worked with them in the past over the years yeah absolutely um our our restoration staff have known them and their work for years but we do have a meeting on the calendar in the next week or so specifically to talk about this issue to consult with them on how to reduce herbicide use here just to learn a little bit more about what they're doing and the specific circumstances of star ranch obviously every restoration project is different um every you know environment and the invasive species you're dealing with the degree of degradation of the habitat how you're trying to restore in your time frame um so really just to understand a little bit more about their circumstances how their circumstances might overlap with the specifics of this restoration project and um the methods that they've had success with would you would you be willing to ask them what their advice would be on if you wanted to reduce herbicides, what their advice would be on how to do that? I'll be very blunt. I'll take anyone's advice. I am <laughs> always open to learning how to do my job better and how to restore this habitat better. Um, you know, that's not to say that we're going to agree with everything that, um, you know, their advice might not be applicable to our specific restoration site, but absolutely, we're open to hearing from everyone. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so at this time, I will uh, entertain a motion. So I've worked with the Laguna Canyon Foundation over the years. I, this looks like a great project, and I'm heartened by the fact that you're willing to be open to talking with different groups. Uh, this is an augmentation of a of a project that WCBB approved a while ago, and so with that, and I also am concerned about any impacts a further delay will have on this project. So with that, I'd like to move to approve item 18. Do I have a second? Okay, thank you, Chuck. We have a first and a second. Any additional questions? Okay, so with that, Mary, can you take the roll call? Chair Boke. Aye. Vice Chair Bonham. Board Member Nagami. Board Member Pavley. Board Member Peralt. Board Member Phillips. No. Board Member Scalar. Yes. Okay, so I think the motion passes. Thank you. Um, so now we are going to move to our presentation items. Item number one, Rebecca. Uh, yeah, 21. Oh, Jeez. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not taking us back to the beginning of the meeting. <laughs> 21, excuse me. Fantastic. Uh, so we will now uh, hear about the California Monarch Recovery Phase 2 project with the Xerces Society. And Kurt Malchow from our staff will do the presentation. Thank you, Rebecca. This proposal is to consider the allocation for a grant to the Xerces Society for a cooperative project with the Natural Resource Conservation Service and private donors to address the decline of monarch butterflies and other insect pollinators by creating high quality habitat distribution across California, targeting monarch overwintering sites and priority breeding zones. Protecting and restoring California's biodiversity hinges on our ability to conserve the state's, bio, state's diversity of beneficial insects and the landscapes they need to survive. Insect pollinators are essential to the reproduction of most flowering plants, including many of California's fruit, vegetable and nut crops, as well as critical food sources for birds, fish, and other animals. Despite this critical role, insects are declining at an alarming rate across the globe. These losses are epitomized by the Western migratory monarch butterfly population, which has dropped by more than 95% since the 1980s. 
The best way to reverse this trend is by restoring monarch migratory and overwintering sites through the inclusion of native milkweeds in restoration plantings. To put this into effect, this project would support the planting of 2,900 acres of monarch habitat across multiple landscape types by planting over 100,000 milkweeds and over 100,000 additional forage plants over the four year life of the project with technical support for restoration and management. The map on the left shows monarch overwintering groves and the agencies managing them and the map on the right shows early and summer breeding zones shaded as to prioritize need for beneficial habitat. This project would distribute plantings across these restoration zones in a way that provides habitat accessibility throughout the monarch butterfly migra migration and overwintering life stages. Next slide, please. The project will be implemented through a monarch and pollinator habitat kit program working in some of the most impacted landscapes to reestablish habitat along agricultural field edges, roadsides, degraded riparian corridors, and urban residential and community garden spaces. These areas start as a blank slate, often consisting of bare soil or invasive plants, and are planted with high density and quality plant materials. The Habitat Kit program supports a full spectrum of plant propagation, distribution, installation, and monitoring. At the start, Xerxes Society assesses the potential of recipients to successfully plant and maintain the kits. Once selected, recipients are provided any necessary instruction before transport and planting. Once planted, technical assistance is offered to assure success. Next slide. The plantings are set up for mobility and accessibility covering smaller areas distributed to priority restoration sites throughout the monarch's migratory route. In this way, plantings can efficiently be distributed to priority restoration sites that cumulatively provide habitat needs to support monarch migratory and breeding life cycles. This slide shows a habitat kit installed providing co-benefits such as increasing pollination for the surrounding orchard and improving the appearance of the landscape. Through a partnership with NRCS, there is also technical support to allow outreach to farmers in areas where pollinator habitat restoration is most needed. Next slide, please. These images highlight how the plantings are complementary with beneficial land use practices, such as on the left, riparian habitat restoration, and on the right, an experimental polyculture food production farm. Next slide. Another benefit of the habitat kits is water use efficiency. This planting site located on a college campus used to be a combination of sod and non-native shrubs requiring daily irrigation. The horticultural department took over the management of this site and turned it into a drought tolerant native pollinator garden used and managed by students and staff. And uh, final slide, please. These images show work supportive to monarch recovery such as non-native tree thinning and installation of, it, of educational signs. This project implements California's 30 by 30 strategy by accelerating on-ground projects that deliver climate benefits through nature-based solutions across the state's diverse landscapes and prioritizing equity by driving solutions that help those residents and communities hit first and hardest by climate change impacts. Staff recommends that the Wildlife Conservation Board approve the project as proposed. Joining us in person from the Research Society Society is Scott Black, Executive Director, Jessica Cruz, Senior Pollinator Conservation Specialist, and Angela Laws, endangered species conservation biologist to address any questions. Additional staff are also joining us remotely. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions from the board? Yeah, I'm having, um, I'm a little, I'm slightly confused. What exactly are we paying for here? Um, we're, we're giving a block grant and then that block grant is being used to provide plants, to, and maybe staff funding to local groups or what are what are we actually paying for here it's it's plant kits contextual with the services that come with successfully installing them it also comes with a pre-selection process on where they would go so there, there are also selection services and and follow-up uh, information that comes with that um is uh, scott here to yeah. elaborate on that okay yeah. thanks but i didn't cover it. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, a lot of this is plants. Plants are expensive. We work with all of our nursery partners to ensure that these plants, that pesticides are not in these plants that we plant. Important. I'm glad we're talking about pesticides. Um, it's also for the staff time to ensure that we vet who are going to plant the plants. We help them uh, in how they're going to successfully get these in the ground and we help them manage them over time because our goal with climate 
based solutions is that long term uh, long term habitat. That's what we're looking for. We're also working with nurseries on the right plants in the right place because we're under climate change now. And so we can't just do plants as usual. We're looking at what plants will work, whether this is in the San Joaquin and this in the Sacramento Valley or or out near the coast and working with nurseries to grow those as well. So it's staff time and it's plants. The staff time is going really to provide the technical support uh, to have these projects be successful. And no pesticides are being used in these projects? Well, no pesticides are being funded through this. Okay. Um, if you look at our website, I really appreciate this conversation. Xerces' goal is to eliminate and minimize pesticide use whenever possible. So we're working with all of our cooperators to try to do that. Um, I can't say that every project won't use pesticides, but that is our goal is to, to minimize that, but no funding from WCB will be used for any pesticides. And the, okay, so the, and the technical assistance, that's not telling them how to apply the herbicides, it's telling them how to grow the plants. It's telling them how to successfully restore these, uh, these, these areas and how to do the plants. And we're looking at those multiple options and really stressing the non-herbicide options in, in all of this, yes. So we're providing much of our support is how do you do this without the use of, of herbicides? So Xerces has sent at least one open general letter to the um, Wildlife Conservation Board when there was opposition to glyphosate, um, urging that the board allow every tool in the toolbox to be used. And it's also supported at least one, and maybe in my memory, maybe two projects that would use glyphosate. What certainty can we have that this money isn't actually going to be used to um, encourage the use of some glyphosate or some other herbicide? Yeah. Well, I appreciate the question. As I said, if you look at our website, our goal is to eliminate or minimize pesticide use. But there are times out there, and this is why we support our par partners in this, when if you want high quality habitat, part of an integrated pest management plan would allow for, as we've said, every tool in, in the toolbox. And I think we need to think more broadly, I'll just be perfectly honest, than just glyphosate. There are worse herbicides out there than glyphosate, actually, from a human health and from a wildlife and water qualities perspective. There are insecticides that are just massively detrimental to humans, pets, and to uh, insecticides that are massively detrimental to humans, pets, and to wildlife. And our goal is to move away from these using an integrated pest management approach. But there are times when you can minimize the use of pesticides, but use some. And over the long term, you can move towards a diverse, high quality habitat that captures carbon and provides for biodiversity. And sometimes that's the only solution. And so we don't want to foreclose that option when it's needed. Well, you and I will just have to agree to disagree. But I'm, again, this money, maybe staff can respond to this. Will this money be going at all to advancing the use of herbicides on these projects? Or is this money going to buying plants essentially and uh, helping people plant them and that sort of thing. I'll, I'll be honest, it will not be used to advance herbicide use in these projects. It'll be okay. used for those other things. Yes, Damien. Just a quick follow-up question on Catherine's question. Uh, question. So um, the briefing says is the project's life is 15 years. And so what does uh, follow up with the groups that are planting look like um, over, over that time? Because I agree that long-term stewardship and management is important. We want to make sure to safeguard the investments. So what does that look like? Yeah. So what that looks like is we've got various partners. So you saw three, really three different things. We've got our plant kits. 
We've got our work with farmers and others in the ag industry, and we've got our work with state parks. So with state parks and other big entities like that, that work will be corresponding with them over the next 15 years to ensure the life of these projects. With NRCS, all of these projects are set up for longevity and we'll be working with NRCS. With the plant kits, which are smaller, we're working with uh, one, our vetting process is to find partners that are planting these in the long term. We'll be getting photos from a select number of them over time, randomly selected so that we know these projects are, are ongoing. So we'll be monitoring them over time, but it's a different monitoring scheme for each of those uh, entities. Thank you. Any other questions? Comments from the board? Um, I have one question. So you said in your uh, in the board report, it says that 35% of your projects will go to disadvantaged communities. How do you define disadvantaged communities? Well, we use a, a variety of markers for that, including as we put in the proposal, looking at your metric for that. But we, when we're doing um, the plant kit projects, and I may go to, to Jessa for this, we vet, we ask a series of questions to get at that. And in the past, we've reached around, uh, over a third of our plant kits have reached disadvantaged communities. And Jessa, do you have more on, on how we vet that? This is Jessa, so who is, is helping manage this project. Wonderful. So you're saying that, so it's the disadvantage in terms of looking at the state definition of disadvantaged? Yes. Okay. Yes. So the income level. Income level, but also we, you know, we work with tribes, we work with other, you know, there there are a variety of metrics, but looking at that as well. Yes. And we've been feeling that we're we need to do more and we would like to do more, but we've been hitting over a third of our plant kits, especially, have been uh going to disadvantaged communities and the neat thing about this project is we're going to be able to hire a staff person down in southern california likely in the los angeles area to work with communities of color specifically to get plants into those communities and this grant will specifically allow us to hire that staff person that we have not had the funding to hire okay yeah, I mean, I'd like to just, you know, the board at the last meeting adopted also the Cal Enviro Screen 4.0 as another layer and only for a part of nature-based solutions. So I want to acknowledge that. But I do, I think, you know, thinking about additional metrics beyond the uh, income, although there's a lot of correlation, um, is something I would recommend. Um and great to hear that you're partnering with tribes. So I think uh, the my just my last question, just how how is it that you market or outreach to find uh, partners for for the kids? Yeah, so we have a really, we've been working in, in California for a long, long time, and we've got partnerships with RCDs, we've got partnership with a whole variety of entities uh, that are that are associated with pollinator conservation. So we're we're marketing in all of those ways, but we're also specifically reaching out to tribes, to other entities that work with disadvantaged communities, um, so that we can make sure that they know about the project and that they can apply. One of the things uh, that we're also doing, which I really love, is we're making sure this project is going to help that as well. We're making sure that we have staff time to work with folks in disadvantaged communities who may not normally know how to do a planting like this, right? Some, some folks we give a plant kit to and they're like, yep, thank you. We know what to do. We're going to solarize this area. We're going to do it. We're going to do it well. We know that as we reach new audiences, we need to be more responsive to providing that feedback so that they'll be successful. And, and that's this, this grant's gonna allow us to do more of that. Thank you. Oh, Damon. So, um, so I, I appreciate the chair's uh, comments on the criteria that came up for the natural nature-based solutions pot funding. 
would you be open to and able to uh, take a look at um, communities within the areas that we had specified for the nature-based solutions pot? So at, uh, severely disadvantaged communities, so SDACs and the top 25% uh, Cal and virus green 4.0 pollution burden communities. Uh, yes, we'd okay. be really excited to look at that and see if that helps us to reach these communities. I mean, our goal is to reach these communities. And I'm going to be honest, as a conservation group, as a person who has worked in this a long time, we're not doing it enough. We, we need to do more. Um, and any of those tools I, I would love to, to look at because what we're doing is really nature-based solutions. And as you've pointed out, as we've known, uh, these communities are more impacted than others. Also, I think it's really important. I grew up in the inner city of Omaha, Nebraska, um, and I had a little place that didn't have houses on it yet where I was there every day turning over rocks finding snakes looking at fireflies at night butterflies in the daytime and so beyond just the biodiversity and the capturing carbon I think getting more habitat to people that can learn and enjoy, and we can see a really different picture of who is a conservationist in the next 30 years, right? Um, I'm not sure I would be standing up here had I not, I lived in the city and we had about a two block area that was just wild. And it's why I'm here. And I'm, so I'm really focused on how do we, how do we do more of that and ensure we have nature for everybody? Thank you so much. We may want to take this into the equity and justice subcommittee, but I know we had been trying to think in the subcommittee about, okay, how do we expand past just the nature-based solutions pot? Um, so there are different things you can do with other projects. If um, and maybe this is, I don't know if this is a question for Colin or, or what on process, but if we could maybe condition the grant to say, please explore, um, uh, you know, not make it a requirement for now, but, you know, make encourage, make best efforts to um, find SDAC 20, top 25% in virus screen, the same criteria from nature-based solutions for this particular project. I think it'd be a good next step. Do you want to make that into a motion? Okay. Okay, Any? sorry, before you do that, any, I, I think, we, any additional questions, comments? Okay, all right. Okay, so I'll move to approve item 21. Uh, with the condition that the applicant make best efforts to uh, find uh, communities that fall within uh, the criteria that the board adopted for the nature-based solutions part of funding at the last meeting, uh, severely disadvantaged communities and communities in the top 25% of Cal and virus green 4.0 pollution burden uh, scores uh, for the um, uh, disadvantaged communities uh, that they're targeting for these projects. And I'd like to make, I'd like to second the motion uh, with the added comment that this is, you know, terrific project and is really complementing uh, things that are going on at the Fish and Game Commission where after the Supreme Court ruling on uh, on uh, bees in January, uh, last uh, year in December, I believe it was, um, there's going to be a lot of activity around, uh, I believe in the coming years in protecting pollinators. So this is a, a terrific compliment to that. Thank you for that second. Um, before we take a vote, uh, I'd like to uh, ask Rebecca if there's any comments, public comments. I, I don't have any speaker cards. Are there any hands raised, Alexa? Oh, I see one over here. We do have one in-person speaker card for Nancy wall -Shirk. Oh, thanks. Come on up, please. Hello again. Hi. I'm so happy to not be in the hot seat this time. <laughs> um, I'm here uh, representing the California Association of Resource Conservation Districts to express our wholehearted support of the Xerces proposal. CARCD and many of the RCDs we support have been working closely with Xerces for well over a decade. 
And over the last several years, this partnership and our collaboration has been stronger and more complex than ever. Um, I know you probably recall that Xerces is a partner on the block grant that WCB recently awarded CRCD. Thank you very much. Um, which includes adding mon monarch and pollinator habitat across California. Because Xerces has a unique skill set that's complementary to the RCDs, this partnership will be very imp a really important factor in our ability to reach our goals under that grant. Xerces CRCD and many of the RCDs are already working together on projects all across the state that are focused on habitat creation and habitat management for monarchs. And the work proposed by Xerces today complements, amplifies, and adds to the positive outcomes for monarchs and pollinators that we're all working towards. Through our experience with Xerces, we recognize the benefits of the specific efforts they'll implement under the grant, such as the habitat kits, conservation planning work, um, use of, of novel monarch and pollinator uh, plant materials and habitat kits and other projects, outreach to a wide range of uh, working land managers, and support of monarch habitat working groups, both at the county level, as well as our um, uh, collaborative um, rangeland working group. Not only does Xerces bring solid and renowned expertise to monarch and, pollinate, monarch and pollinator conservation, they also demonstrate integrity, transparency, dedication to partnerships and collaborations, and a focus on practical, tangible results. You can trust that Xerces will accomplish all that they promise in their proposal and more. We strongly recommend that you award them this grant. It will make a real difference. Thank you. Thank you. Alexi, any other hands? We do have one additional, oh, two additional raised hands. The first will be Brian Pimentel. You should be able to unmute yourself. Hello. Um, thank you for allowing me to speak today. I just wanted to voice how um, crucial the Xerces Society has been on implementing pollinator habitat throughout Placer County. Um, forgot to mention I'm with the Placer Resource Conservation District. I'm the Ag Program Coordinator. Um, I've worked very closely with Xerces to implement pollinator projects all throughout Placer County on private and public lands. Um, this this uh, approval would help them uh, expand their current pollinator um, uh, uh, kit project and program, which in turn uh, provides means for uh, landowners and farm managers to increase diversity uh, within their own properties and operations um, without uh, with uh, reducing the economic burden of, of having to purchase these plants. Um, and so, yes, that is all I have to say. Thank you. The Thanks. next comment will be Ruby Stahel. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, good. I am the conservation project manager at the Napa County Resource Conservation District. And I'm just here to speak in full support of the Xerces Society and their project. Napa Resource Conservation District has worked closely with Xerces in the last couple of years on promoting their habitat kit program in our region to help implement planned projects on the ground. And we often have grants that support our planning and technical assistance efforts, but acquiring a significant amount of actual native and regionally specific plants to get these projects to move forward is a challenge. So when we partner with Xerces to get the actual work of getting habitat in the ground, we've seen immediate results of breeding monarchs appearing at project sites during the first spring and summer, right after the fall planting. These are long-term projects that have an immediate impact. And that has been important, not only to bring back the monarchs and other pollinators, but also to inspire more landowners to want to implement similar projects. So I hope you support this monarch recovery project as we know firsthand that Xerces is making an impact. The next will be Derek Emmons. Hi, greetings everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yes. yes. Cool, thank you. Uh, my name is Derek Emmons. I am the Agriculture Conservation Coordinator at the Contra Costa County RCD. 
And uh, I would also like to echo this support for the Xerxes Society and the Habitat Kids. Um, for any of you that are familiar with the East Bay, um, especially Contra Costa County, uh, we don't have quite the same type of agricultural landscape that some of our neighboring counties like Sonoma and Napa have as during the 60s all the way to the 90s, uh, much of our orchards, rangelands, you know, have been turned into urbanized and suburbanized uh, areas. And so when I came onto this job a few years back and my, and my work is specifically to um, engage producers in uh, implementing conservation and restorative land management, um, you know, one of the challenges was that so many of our operations, which are, you know, run by food justice nonprofits, school gardens turned into actual functioning farms that are feeding, feeding the student population. Um, a lot of these operations ended up falling through the cracks for many of the federal and state funding pools. And so, when it came to the Xerxes Society Hedgerow Kits, these were really crucial in actually keeping our working partnerships and the trust of our local communities um, going. This was actually something tangible where we could work together, um, get these native plants into the landscape, and also engage students and broader community members on what it means to actually have co-benefits that yes we are doing this for monarchs and we are doing it for soil and we are doing it for ourselves and so i still have a lot of gratitude um for xerxes for uh, you all and the work that you do and i hope that you uh continue your support of this program thank you Any we other have, hands? Yes, we have one more public comment oh, for Wendell Gilgert. You should be able to unmute now. Hello, uh, my name is Wendell Gilgert. I am um, uh, Emeritus Director for a Working Lands Program uh, for Point Blue Conservation Science. Prior to going to con uh, Point Blue, I was with the Natural Resources Conservation Service for 35 years. And in the capacity of uh, working with the Natural Resources Conservation Service, uh, I was a state biologist in California in the early 2000s, where I encountered Xerxes uh, Society for the first time. And since then, um, we have worked together not only with uh, the Natural Resources Conservation Service, but with Point Blue to get conservation practices on the ground. And one of the things that I really like to support this project is I really feel like it's um, strategically uh, well-planned, it's targeted, it's organized. Uh, and, and having worked with Point Blue for, or uh, Xerxes for the last over uh, two decades, uh, they produce. And one of the things that we've learned with working with, with Xerxes is these pollinator projects are easy cells. And, the work that we started here in California and then uh, was going on in Oregon expanded now nationally where um, the Xerxes Society have partner biologists scattered all around the United States and doing very effective pollinator work uh, in, in the uh, various regions uh, that NRCS serves in, in the United States. I would like to say that, that the, um, the program that, that provides producers and even backyard gardeners with uh, plants for pollinators is, is a really uh, phenomenal success. And, you know, I've talked to a number of people who have engaged that program. And it is, again, strategically located by region here in California and in other regions where uh, Xerxes is working. So uh, I, can, I can say that I'm, I really am comfortable knowing that these plan, these projects will be planned, they'll be assessed, they'll be designed, they'll be implemented, they'll be monitored, and I believe that they'll be uh, totally effective in getting pollinator habitat, especially monarch habitat on the ground. 
thank you for the opportunity to, vi to visit with you. Thank you. Okay, I think we're done with public comments. Okay, so Mary, will you take a roll call, please? Chair Bouquet. Aye. Vice Chair Bonham. Board Member Nagami. Yes. Board Member Pavley. Yes. Board Member Peralt. Yes. Board Member Phillips. Yes. Board Member Scalar. Yes. Great, motion carries. Um, now we'll move on to item 22. I made a, a mistake earlier when we were talking about Highway 97. I had my geography mixed up. Catherine, it's the corridor between I-5 and Southern Oregon. So I think what you've got is the trucks coming in from Southern Oregon. And the only other way to get over is 66. So same points apply. I just got my road geography totally. Yeah, up. that's what I figured. <laughs> Since we're going back to the Klamath, I wanted to make sure people understood I wasn't crazy. All right, great. So let's move on to number 22. We have the Butte Valley Wildlife Area Wetland Enhancement Phase 2 uh, going to the California Water Fall Association. And James Croft of the WCB staff will present this item. Thank you, Rebecca. Good afternoon. This proposal is to consider the allocation for a grant to California Waterfowl Association for a cooperative project with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife to complete 1,420 acres of wetland enhancement and restoration at the Butte Valley Wildlife Area. This project is the second and final phase of a project to enhance and restore wetland habitat at the wildlife area. Phase one was completed in 2022 and allocated 872,000 to enhance 1,609 acres of wetland and upland habitat on the wildlife area. Next slide, please. The Butte Valley Wildlife Area is located approximately four and a half miles from the community of McDowell on the western edge of Meese Lake in Siskiyou County. The wildlife area is a 13,400 acre state-owned property composed of managed seasonal wetland units, sage flats, wet meadows, farmland, upland, and the 4,000 acre Meese Lake. Historically, the wildlife area consisted of a seasonally flooded Meese Lake, emergent marsh, and wet meadow habitat within the Butte Valley Basin. During the 1940s, previous landowners established dikes and excavated drain ditches to reclaim the land for grain production and other agricultural purposes. Several dams were created in order to capture seasonal runoff and utilize it to irrigate grain and meadow pasture on the reclaimed land. Next slide, please. The California Department of Fish and Wildlife acquired the property in 1981 and established it as a state wildlife area. In the year, years following, CDFW has managed many of the previously established grain units as seasonal wetlands. Public use opportunities at the wildlife area include camping, hiking, wildlife viewing, and waterfowl and upland game bird hunting. Next slide, please. In the face of climate change, water use efficiency has become the highest priority to su supply, sustain, and effectively manage wetland acreage. Several existing wetland units were created decades ago with levee materials excavated from deep borrow ditches. Miles of these ditches must be filled five to six feet deep with water before water can be su supplied to the wetland units. Use of these ditches causes significant water loss from evaporation, subbing, and plant transpiration. Additionally, existing corrugated metal pipe water control structures leak severely and make holding water within the wetland units challenging. Next slide, please. Earthwork and water delivery infrastructure improvements will result in greatly improved water use efficiency, biological diversity, and wetland management capabilities. Existing porous wetland unit perimeter levees will be refurbished and broad levee side slopes will be built to combat rodent and erosion issues. Deep borrow ditches will be filled with previously excavated spoil materials. Several managed wetland seasonal, several seasonal wetland units dominated by rank stands of emergent vegetation will be disked and enhanced with swales, islands, and benches to promote moist soil seed production following initial wetland flood up annually. The project will also install a solar array to complement an existing solar array. The array will support the electrical needs of low lift pumps, allowing for the drainage of up to 480 acres of seasonal wetlands, enhancing management for moist soil plants as forage resources for waterfowl. Additionally, new water recovery pipelines attached to the low lift pumps will then allow for water from the seasonal, seasonal wetlands to be recycled and utilized to flood up to 100 acres of newly developed semi-permanent brood habitat on the area. Next slide, please. 
Several semi-permanent wetland units will be developed for waterfowl brooding and molting. Units will be designed to handle deeper water depths to prevent the complete takeover of tule and cattail growth as water is held over the summer each year. Outdated corrugated metal pipe water structure, control structures will be removed and replaced with concrete risers and high density polyethylene pipe to improve water management capabilities. The installation of a direct PVC pipeline water delivery system attached to the area's main uh, water source will alleviate the need to fill miles of delivery ditches to supply and maintain existing wetland units. Next slide, please. The semi-permanent wetland unit will be constructed adjacent to this upland area that was enhanced in the previous WCBF project. Pairing this upland nesting habitat with the newly constructed brood rearing and semi-permanent wetland. Next slide, please. Completion of the project will allow CDFW staff to manage and sustain priority wetland habitat more efficiently and precisely at the wildlife area. This will improve foraging, breeding, and nesting resources for waterfowl and create additional wetland habitat at the wildlife area. The increase in quality wetland resources near the Klamath Basin will provide key wetland acreage for a host of bird species being impacted by the drying and loss of habitat, and loss of habitat due to climate change and increasingly limited water supplies in the West. Uh, this slide is the restoration design that we're working on for uh, this project. On the south there, you can see, um, not highlighted with the blue uh, little ponding, uh, you can see the seasonal wetland units that were created with the previous project. Uh, currently, the, the wildlife area doesn't have the resources to drain those seasonal wetland units. So with this project, will the solar array will allow those wetland units to be drained and that water recycled each year and pumped into the new semi-permanent waterfowl brood unit that you can see on the top. And that uh, semi-permanent uh, wetland will be flooded throughout the summer to provide brood rearing and molting habitat for waterfowl. Um, yeah, that's about it. Staff recommends that the Wildlife Conservation Board approve this project as proposed. Uh, on the call today on Zoom is, is Greg Heideman, Regional Biologist for California Waterfowl Association. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions, comments from the board? Okay, Becca, any public comments? I don't have any speaker cards. Alexa, do we have any hands raised? There are no hands raised. Motion, okay. Motion to approve Please. this staff recommend. Second. Great. There's a first and a second. Quick question. Okay. Just um, is this particular project uh, overlying a groundwater basin that's on the Sigma list? No. Uh, no. This actually, this area is in um, what's called a, um, a terminal basin. So many of the drainages. Um, from the surrounding agricultural lands kind of drain into Meese Lake. Um, so the groundwater table is actually quite high. So it's relatively high. Okay, thank you. Because it was pumping. And yeah. I'd love the solar to be able to use the energy for doing that. Yeah, for, for this project um, and for many of the projects that we have on the wildlife area, when we're talking about pumping costs, we're not necessarily always talking about groundwater pumping, mm -hmm. but more pumping costs related to moving water around. Because yep. oftentimes water delivery ditches are not set at the same elevation as our wetland units. So sometimes we have to push water up to get into a wetland unit or push water from a wetland unit up into a water delivery or drainage ditch. 20% of our state's energy That's comes so comes from the moving, treating, and heating of water. Mm -hmm. And so that's really important that a lot of these multi-beneficial kind of projects solve, help solve different problems in that. Senator, this, this project is emblematic of what the department's doing across its whole land assets of modernization. And the benefits are in all directions, for example, get off diesel pumps. Yeah, so thank you. this is an example of what we're doing across a million acres. Good. And I've worked to integrate, uh, you know, solar and renewable energy uh, into as many of the inland wetland conservation grant program uh, projects that, that we can where it's feasible. And you'll see more of these, uh, these type of uh, project activities in the future. Okay. Thank you. Great. All right. Do you want to take the roll call? Chair Bokday? Aye. Vice Chair Bonham? Yes. Board Member Nagami? Yes. Board Member Pavley? Yes. Board Member Peralt? Yes. Board Member Phillips? Yes. Board Member Scalar? Yes. Great, motion passes. Um, now on to item 23.
Great. So we're going to do oops. Uh, item 23, Klamath Hydroelectric Settlement Parcel B Lands. Uh, Brian Gibson from the WCB staff will presenting this item. Thank you, Rebecca. This proposal is to consider WCB entering into a property transfer agreement on behalf of the California Department of Fish and Wildlife for a future acceptance of approximately 7,027 acres from the Klamath River Renewal Corporation as part of a no-cost acquisition for the protection of fisheries, water, and to provide future wildlife-oriented public use opportunities. Uh, the property proposed for acceptance, known as the Parcel B Lands, is located approximately 16 miles northeast of the city of Wairika in Siskiyou County. The town of Hornbrook is approximately six miles west of the Parcel B Lands, and Copco Village lies at its eastern boundary. Uh, the property is also adjacent to CDFW's Horseshoe Ranch Wildlife Area. Uh, next slide, please. The Klamath Basin watershed covers approximately 9.4 million acres, stretching from the volcanic cascades of southern Oregon through the Klamath Mountains to the Pacific Ocean. The Klamath River is linked to the health of its surrounding communities, businesses, and environment. The Klamath Basin's diverse communities include Native Americans, farmers, ranchers, loggers, miners, and fishermen. And this map here shows the, uh, the watershed location of the four, uh, four dams that will be removed. Uh, J.C. Boyle Dam in Southern Oregon, then the three remaining dams in Northern California, where we, we're talking about today. Uh, next slide. The Klamath Basin's hydrologic system consists of a complex of interconnected rivers, lakes, marshes, dams, diversions, and wilderness areas. Alterations to the natural hydrologic system began in the late 1800s accelerating in the early 1900s, including water diversions by private water users, the United States Bureau of Reclamation's Klamath Irrigation uh, Project, and by hydroelectric developments operated by Pacific Corp. Next slide. In 2010, a diverse group of stakeholders, including Pacific Corp, the United States Department of Interior and Department of Commerce, as well as the states of California and Oregon, signed the Klamath Hydroelectric Settlement Agreement to signify their intent to move forward with the removal of four hydroelectric dams located on the Klamath River. The Klamath Hydroelectric Settlement Agreement was amended in 2016 to provide for the transfer and de decommissioning of these dams. Next slide, please. The four dams are J.C. Boyle, Copco No. 1, Copco No. 2, and Iron Gate. The purpose of the project is to achieve a free-flowing condition and fish passage in the Klamath River in the reaches currently occupied by these developments. Pacific Corp's Klamath hydroelectric project was constructed between 1911 and 1962. The project included eight developments, including the four previously mentioned dams. Pacific Corp operated the Klamath Hydroelectric Project under a 50-year license issued by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. In March of 2018, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission amended the Klamath Hydroelectric Project license to remove the four dams, which, are, which now comprise the Lower Klamath Project. The Klamath River Renewal uh, Corporation has already begun work to remove the Lower Klamath Project consistent with the terms of the settlement agreement. Under the settlement agreement, the project consists of measures to remove the four dams, remediate and restore the reservoir sites, avoid or minimize adverse impacts downstream, and assure completion of the project with committed funds. Next slide, please. And next slide, please. The project proposes a schedule of removal of Copco Dam 2 this year, followed by removal of Iron Gate and Copco 1 dams in 2024. Transfer of the Parcel B lands to the state of, state of California, if feasible, would occur no sooner than when the three dams have been decommissioned and restoration is complete. And this slide shows 2023, basically they're going in, they're working on infrastructure and roadways for heavy equipment to get in to uh, remove the dams. Uh, 2024, most of the dam removal will be complete. Restoration will begin, and then restoration will take several years to complete. Uh, next slide, please. The Klamath River supports Chinook salmon, coho salmon, steelhead trout, coastal cutthroat trout, 
and green and white sturgeon. Dam removal is expected to result in significant improvements to mainstream Klamath River hydrology, in-stream habitat, and water quality. In addition, dam removal is expected to decrease the incidence of disease downstream of Iron Gate Dam, thereby improving survival of fish throughout the Klamath River watershed. It is anticipated that fall run Chinook salmon, coho salmon, stillhead trout will utilize portions of the Klamath River that flow through the Parcel B lands upstream of Iron Gate Dam soon after dam removal. Next slide, please. Future public access to the Parcel B lands will be provided for low impact recreational activities, including kayaking, fishing, hiking, bird watching, photography, and bicycle use. The potential transfer of the Parcel B lands to CDFW will not occur immediately. In the interim, other potential future transferees of Parcel B lands may be identified, such as tribes and non-governmental organizations. The board's approval of this project will allow WCB to enter into the property transfer agreement with Klamath River Renewal Corporation, thereby giving Klamath River Renewal Corporation assurance of a future transferee before undertaking significant financial expenditures in dam removal and restoration. In addition, the property transfer agreement will undergo Department of General Services review and approval. Staff will report back to the board when the property transfer has occurred. And then uh, staff recommends that the board grant permission to enter into the proposed property transfer agreement and authorize staff and CDFW to proceed substantially as planned. And in the audience is uh, Kevin Takai. He's an attorney with CDFW. Michael Harris, he's the CDFW Klamath manager. And then Laura Hazlett, she's the chief operations officer and chief financial officer for Klamath River Renewal Corporation. Great, thank you. Um, are there any questions from the board? Comments? Okay, are there any speaker cards? I have one quick oh, question. Yes. Uh, long term operation and maintenance uh, will be CDFW. Yes. Because it's public agencies and the interchange from it. Yes, after okay. CFW takes yes. possession of the property. It's a very exciting project. Yeah, definitely. Okay, we, I did want to just note that we did get one late uh, letter in opposition from Kelsey Stangeby. So that's written into the record. Um, and then we do have one card, at least one from um, Kelsey Stangeby. Is he online? No, that person is not online. All right, one additional speaker card we got was from Richard Marshall. See online. Richard Marshall, you should be able to unmute yourself. This is Richard Marshall, President of Siskiyou County Water Users Association, and we'd like to re register our opposition to the continued growth of agencies in Siskiyou County taking property off our tax rolls. And also this project has never gone before the planning commission here in uh, Siskiyou County. And it seems like the local population should have some kind of input into this process. Of course, this is what I'm doing right now, but uh, that's our uh, position on it. And we also wonder about the Shasta tribes who never settled with the uh, United States, never reached a treaty with the United States. And this really was traditional Shasta land. We wanna make sure that they're certainly taken care of in the process. That's my comment. Thank you. Chair, if I could on the tribal component. So of course, you know, but others may not. You. you so WCB is the real estate agent for the Department of Fish and Wildlife. So that's why we're here today. The transfer of these acres is part of a contractual settlement commitment. But before any eventual disposition after the department received them, we will be completing with the Natural Resources Agency a process that's been running for several years where we've been in consultation with tribal governments across the basin and also have made the process available for additional government input to determine what might be the best future disposition of the acres. 
It could be tribes, it could be local government, it could be the department. So that process is playing out and your approval today just allows the stability for the removal agent to complete the large scale work, knowing the property transfers taken care of in the background. Thank you. I think that uh, completes the public comment. Uh, I have one additional raise oh, one hand. More? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, William Simpson, you should be able to unmute yourself. Hello, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead, please. Okay, thank you. Um, my name is William E. Simpson. I'm a landowner and a rancher contiguous to the properties and parcel B. Um, <clears throat> the historic land use as described in item 23 of your agenda does not fully and, and completely uh, explain how this land has been used historically for the past 200 years. Uh, it's documented as being um, agricultural land and it's currently cross fence. It was used extensively for livestock grazing and is still to this day considered statutory open range in our county. And as a livestock owner myself, our horses do indeed continue, still use and have used this land for many, many years. Um, <clears throat> so the description of how this land has been used by Mr. Gibson or and in the item is not in item 23 is not correct. It has primarily been used for livestock grazing and secondarily for hunting and a far third and fourth would be recreation as far as hiking and what have you, because there is, is wilderness with a lot of rattles up here. Um, the other thing is, is I'm very concerned as a landowner for lack of notice and transparency with regard to the potential rezoning of land right next to my land. There has been no public notice given as to this agenda item, which is called being called a final agenda. I've never seen the preliminary agenda as a landowner who's adversely affected by this entire project, which is really should have been a uh, eminent domain project uh, in the removal of these dams, given it's a public project using public funding. Um, given the advantages uh, for me as a part of a disadvantaged community, I would like to see this, this project stopped right now until we have further evaluation and correction of the agenda item and explaining the correct use of the land historically and currently so that the board can make an informed decision. Um, as it is right now, it's misrepresented. Thank you. Any other hands, Alexa? There are no additional raised hands. Okay, thank you. Any additional questions, comments from the board? Okay, with that, I'll entertain a motion. I move. Is there a no, second? Sorry. Eric can, yeah, I think Eric yes, second. Yes. Okay. All right. Mary, can you take a roll call, please? Chair Bobde? Uh Yes. Vice Chair Bonham? Board Member Nagami? Yes. Board Member Pavle? Board Member Peralt? Yes. Board Member Phillips? Yes. Board Member Scalar? Yes. Great. Uh, motion carries. Now uh, moving on to item number 24. Rebecca? Great. So we're going to stay in the Klamath, and we have a public access for renewed Klamath River project going to the Klamath River Renewal Corporation, and Alyssa Benedetti from our, our staff will present. This proposal is to consider a grant to Klamath River Renewal I can't, Corporation. Can you <clears throat> speak up just a little bit? Oh, okay. yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. This proposal is to consider a grant to Klamath River Renewal Corporation to implement three public access facilities within the hydroelectric settlement project area. In relation to the current dam sites, the locations are above Copco number one, which is being called Copco Valley, below Copco number two at Fall Creek, and directly below the Iron Gate Dam and Fish Hatchery facility. The project is entirely within regions classified as either disadvantaged community or severely disadvantaged community by the DWR mapping tool. Next slide, please. Dam removal will transform outdoor recreation opportunities on the lower Klamath River. 
Copco and Iron Gate reservoirs will no longer exist. Instead, new facilities will support safe access for whitewater rafting, kayaking, and fishing on a revitalized and free-flowing river. Next slide. The chosen locations connect contiguous reaches of the Klamath at key locations where the difficulty of the river changes, so they can serve as both put-in and take-out sites. For example, the Copco Valley site is a short distance upstream of the entrance to Wards Canyon, where the river transitions to a class four whitewater run. The takeout for this run would be at the next site downstream, which is Fall Creek. Next slide. Um, these are some shots of the existing facility that's at Fall Creek, uh, which will be improved under this project, and the other two facilities will be brand new. And each of the sites will provide parking, restrooms, access trails and roads, boat ramps, picnic tables, trash and dog waste receptacles, and appropriate signage. ADA accessibility and public safety features will be included along with interpretive signage, providing information about fish and wildlife and cultural resources. Next slide. The new public access sites will ensure that access to the renewed river takes place at designated areas, both for the benefit of public safety and with respect to cultural resources and ongoing habitat restoration following the dam removal. And as we saw in the timeline with the previous presentation, uh, the dam removal activities are underway um, and expected to be complete by the end of 2024. Construction of the public access components will take place in the same time frame as the dam removal work, which creates cost efficiencies and reduces the length of interruption to recreation on the Klamath, with the goal of being open to the public in 2025. And last slide, please. Staff recommends that the Wildlife Conservation Board adopt the written findings and approve the project as proposed. And Laura, again, Laura Hazlett is with us over Zoom on behalf of Klamath River Renewal Corporation. Great, thank you. Are there any comments, questions from the board? Quick question and sort of the same one, hard to be repetitive. Um, will WCB also after the, the, the completion of the dam removal be the entity that'll operate and maintain this facility? I'm sorry, I can't hear that. Will WCB be the entity that will operate and maintain the facility after the dam removal. No, that would be um, Department of Fish and Wildlife, assuming the land does transfer to them or a, de okay. a designee, Fish however, and wildlife. however okay. that. Yes, exactly. Yeah. But it will become there. Yes. They're going to be very busy. <laughs> All right. Any other questions, comments from the board? Okay, are there any public comment cards? Yeah, it looks like yes. we have one speaker card from Laura Hazlitt. Hi, I'm Laura Hazlitt, uh, Chief Operations Officer from KRRC. I obviously uh, am speaking in support of the project, uh, but mostly I wanted to thank uh, WCB for considering the project. A key concern that we've heard from stakeholders in the basin is access to the river. And uh, this, uh, these rec sites would provide that access. And then finally, I just very much appreciate the time that staff has put into preparing for this presentation today. So thank you. Alexa, do we have any other hands? There are no hands raised. All right. Uh, so is there a motion? I'll make a motion to Great, thank you, Chuck. Is there a second? A second. All right, thank you, Damon. We have a first and a second. Mary, will you take the roll call? Chair Bookday? Uh, yes. Vice Chair Bonham? Yes. Board Member Nagami? Yes. Board Member Pavley? Yes. Board Member Peral? Yes. Board Member Phillips? Yes. Board Member Scalar? Uh, yes. Great, thank you. Motion carries. We will move on to item number 25. Rebecca? Yeah, so item 25 is Rancho Briscow Riparian Habitat Restoration going to River Partners and Kara Allen of our staff will present this project. Thank you, Rebecca, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, lean in a little bit here. Uh, okay, so agenda item 25 is a proposal for a grant to River Partners 
for a cooperative project with the Bureau of Land Management to restore 130 acres of degraded ag land into mixed riparian habitat. The project site is known as Rancho Breezegow and is a unit of BLM Sacramento River Bend area and is adjacent to two wildlife areas that are owned and managed by CDFW. Uh, Rancho Breezegow is on the border of Shasta and Tehama counties, approximately seven miles east of Cottonwood at the confluence of Battle Creek and the Sacramento River. Uh, Battle Creek is a critical watershed for spring and fall run Chinook salmon and steelhead, and the Coleman National Fish Hatchery releases hundreds of thousands of Chinook salmon and steelhead into Battle Creek every year, and is why this area has been the focus of many groups in restoring aquatic and riparian, uh, riparian habitat along the lower reach of Battle Creek. Next slide. So these three maps show how the project area that is identified by the red star um, fits within a larger conservation landscape with the bottom left map showing the project being on the edge of connected protected areas. The top left map showing the project building upon previous WCB investments, including land acquisitions and easements, water dedications and water uh, riparian and stream flow planning projects. And the right map shows the project being located at the northern end of an important bird area in the Sacramento River Valley that has been identified by the National Audubon Society. Next slide. Uh, this map takes a closer look at what's happening immediately adjacent to the project area, and that this is just uh, one piece of a much larger restoration landscape that uh, several partners are working to advance over the next five to 10 years that will restore terrestrial habitat, anadromous fish spawning and rearing habitat, and reconnect historic floodplains of both the Sacramento River and Battle Creek over uh, 400 acres for some of our most at-risk species. Next slide. Uh, Rancho Breezegow was farmed for over a century as walnut orchards and row crops that removed the na uh, native riparian habitat from the site. Uh, BLM has phased out the site's farming, and the pictures here show how the orchards provide little to no habitat value, and the fallow row crops are now fields of highly invasive plants that over the years have transitioned from one nasty weed to another, um, and is keeping the site in a degraded state that is a barrier to wildlife movement, prohibits native plant recruitment, creates poor soil conditions, and is a source of weeds for the region. Uh, the top left picture is in the remnant shaded riparian areas along Battle Creek. Uh, that you can see in the distance of the bottom picture. And although the saplings um, might not look that threatening in this picture, um, mature tree of heaven does overtop our native riparian trees. And without treatment, it can easily become the dominant species along the Battle Creek corridor. Next slide. So in 2015, WCB funded a planning grant with River Partners to develop a habitat restoration plan for the 306 acres of Rancho Breezegow. Uh, this plan was developed in collaboration with 14 different groups and was reviewed under CEQA as a mitigated negative declaration. Uh, the project before you today is for Field 1, which is the beige colored uh, area on the map. Uh, there are plans to restore the other fields, but that work has been put on hold as planning and design is underway for a large side channel project that would affect fields two and four, uh, which are the orange and pink colors on that map. The goals of the field one restoration are to increase habitat connectivity with the surrounding conserved lands, enhance and create habitat for several taxonomic groups, including beneficial insects and a few protected species, and help this site be more resilient to climate change. Next slide. So to meet the project goals, River Partners will start by mechanically removing 120 acres of walnut orchard and treating 13 different noxious weed species that pose a significant threat to the site's ecosystem integrity. Uh, mechanical, manual, and chemical methods are needed to achieve the restoration outcomes in a four-year period across the entire 130-acre site. Uh, these treatments have been developed with BLM and pesticide control advisors that are licensed by the state under the California Department of Pesticide Regulation. Uh, 
Uh, each treatment method and chemical were also reviewed by BLM at the programmatic and site-specific level under NEPA for their direct, indirect, and cumulative impacts on human health and the environment, and a finding of no significant impact was determined, and a concurrence letter was provided by U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service uh, for the listed species. Uh, more recently, CDFW's Integrated Pest Management Specialist and the California Inv Invasive Plant Council both reviewed and provided input on the project's herbicide form. And the project team has considered their suggestions and has agreed to use non-glyphosate products as the initial chemical treatment and will evaluate its effectiveness before considering using glyphosate for any subsequent retreatments. Uh, River Partners also did a cost analysis for treating the site with hand labor, and it was an astonishing $18 million, or three and a half times the total project cost, compared to $200,000 when using propo the uh, proposed integrated pest management approach. And prior to any native plants being installed, a well will be drilled on the property in the South Battle Creek subbasin which has been rated as a very low priority basin by the Tehama County Flood Control and Water Conservation District. Uh, once that irrigation system is in place, over 28,000 native trees, shrubs, forbs, and grasses uh, will be planted from local seed and plant material and maintained and monitored through the grant term. Uh, monitoring will begin in year one before any work begins and will continue annually for effectiveness monitoring and qualitative and quantitative performance monitoring to document how plants and wildlife are responding to the restoration and to inform adaptive management of the site. Next slide. So by the end of the project, 130 acres of new riparian habitat will extend from the banks of Lower, Lower Battle Creek, providing essential habitat for birds, fish, and invertebrates, and expanding the riparian corridor to allow species to move uh, more freely and adjust to a changing climate. Uh, by reducing noxious plant cover to 25%, the, uh, the site will be more, more resilient to fire, flood, and drought. BLM will be able to manage the site with minimal intervention, and passive recruitment by natives uh, will play a role in outcompeting non-native plants and sustaining the native plant community. And with an increase in floristic diversity and structure, the site will attract more wildlife and invertebrates that will contribute to fo uh, food webs both on land and water and help restore healthy soil properties at the site. Uh, throughout the project's long history, meaningful partnerships have been formed across all levels of government, NGOs, and tribes that will continue beyond the project for monitoring and managing the site and advancing the other projects in the watershed. And with us today in the audience and online are several people from the project team that can help answer questions and would also like to address the board about, about the project and have submitted speaker cards. Thank you. Any questions from the board? Yeah, I have. Okay, Catherine. I have a question or two questions. One is how far is the potentially, um, is the area that's going to be treated with herbicides, how far is that from the water source from the creek? So I will call upon either uh, Tori with River Partners or Brooke with BLM to uh, provide more information on that that question. Yeah, how far is the the can area that's- up to the, sorry, can you come up to the podium, please? Sorry, sure. thanks. How far is the area that's going to be treated with herbicides from the, the creek itself? Most of the area that's gonna be treated that's near the Battle Creek side because it's the Northern portion of the entire footprint of Rancho Brisgau, it's the phase one, field one, which is the very Northern portion, is the very far East side. And it's mostly all enhancement area where um, it's mechanical removal as well as some herbicide use, selective herbicides. So Brooke, I'm gonna turn it over to Brooke because she's on site daily almost, so. 
Yeah, I mean, I don't know if I have a great estimate in my head of like the distance, um, but there is a buffer of riparian habitat between Field One um, and Battle Creek. So there's the, do you think then that the chances of runoff from the herbicide treat, treated area during storm years, storm months, is um, potentially the runoff would go into the creek? Is it that close or? Yeah, so we have some standard operating procedures we follow for herbicide use. Some of them are buffer distances for herbicide use near waterways. Um, things like we don't spray 24 hours before it's supposed to rain. We don't spray when the wind is more than five miles per hour. And all of those operating procedures would be implemented on this project with any herbicide use. So but these have this, been- The soil could still run off. Um, I mean, soil has been analyzed in our NEPA documents, any impacts to that. So we would follow our SOPs to mitigate any impacts. So the soil could run off into the, the creek then, I guess is what I'm saying is that they're potentially, I mean, it, it is not unusual uh, during a heavy rain for the soil to run off into a creek. If you have soil that has been contaminated with herbicides and the herbicide is persistent, doesn't that mean that the herbicide flows into the creek? Um, I, I would just like uh, to add that uh, this is a very flat area. So it's not like a, a downslope okay. where things would run off. Uh, any water that, you know, rain that falls on the site is going to in a, in a sink into the ground and it's not going to be running into the creek. So just a little addition. Um, and then my next question was the $18 million estimate. Has staff seen what has gone into that estimate, had a chance to analyze that? Uh, WCB staff. That was one of the efforts um, when we were uh, building the budget to look at what it was the feasibility and what were the real impacts of uh, you know a budget that only utilized hand labor. So we based it off of the budget that we had built for uh, the full project, which was the 306 acres, and then the reevaluation of it broke it down by the per acre cost from our initial evaluation. So that was based on a full budget what that would take to do the same type of effort uh, without using herbicide. And so it winds up being about 75 hours per acre times 130 acres, which equals 9,750 hours per event. And based on the fact that this project requires um, the prevailing wages, it drives the cost to over $18 million. And that's just over the three-year project. And the hand labor alone would likely not even eliminate the invasives on site because it's a longer process than that. So just for the project period for what we have submitted the proposal to WCB for, um, just that three years was $18 million. And then that also equates to over 61 uh, people per acre working constantly. And so that workforce is almost impossible to get to and for especially for that region. So I this some of this sounds pretty amazing to me. I know. Um and when you're saying hand labor, are you talking about like literally you need to have people as opposed to machines? They're not using machinery or they are weed whip, oh, okay. weed whipping and other tools, yes. But it's it's just human labor rather than like any type of herbicide. Would it be possible for you at some point to send that to the board to see? Because I'd like to see yes. how, how it breaks down. Yeah, it's, you know, it's a, based off of our budget that we submitted, so. Yeah, but maybe you could go into more detail than just in the budget, but I'd like to know how it sure. breaks down. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions or I'm good, Catherine? Okay. Any other questions, comments from the board? All right, do we have any comments from the public? Yeah, we have quite a number of speaker cards. So I would just ask you to please um, keep your comments as brief as possible and not repeat things that have been said necessarily. But uh, let's go through with uh, Julie Rentner first from River Partners. Good afternoon, board, uh, chair. 
Um, it's a pleasure to address you today, Julie Rettner. I'm the president of River Partners, um, and I've had the uh, pleasure of participating in habitat restoration here in California, and especially in the Central Valley for almost two decades. Um, River Partners as an organization has been working for 25 years to restore former degraded agricultural lands into native forests, grasslands, and shrublands. And to date, we've completed 20,000 acres of such conversion, which has resulted in the annual avoidance of 60 tons of chemical application on California lands, an area over 30 square miles of California that no longer has repeated chemical applications as a result of our work. I commend and applaud the board for taking on this very important topic of how do we reduce and minimize the use of herbicides in restoration projects. It's critically important and the work that's been done to date has really improved the way the entire practice behaves. Um, I want to note that there's not a simple answer to this question because it's a question that has involved many <laughs> multi-generational science and practice um, to come to the point we are today where we strongly believe that the very judicious and careful application of very limited amounts of herbicides is a required tool in the toolbox to complete our work. So thank you for your support today. All right, next I have Alden Neal with uh, Bureau of Land Management. Uh, first off, I want to thank the board for considering this project. We've been working on this since 2011 to get here, get the NEPA done. Um, and then I also want to do, um, you know, express our support to our partners that have, you know, really brought this a long way to be here. And then I also wanted to also express that the Sacramento um, River Bend area is a critical environmental, uh, of critical environmental concern. And uh, that that makes it so we have to do special management in this area. And so the reason why it's designated as an ACEC is that it has um, critical values for um, rare habitats, plants, wildlife, and cultural resources. And the values for this ACEC have increased importance because they fall within a statewide identified essential corridor of high uh, biological value. And these corridors are areas of natural habitat that are especially important for resiliency of an era of climate change. So thank you guys. Thanks. We have Steve Lehman from BLM. Um, yes, uh, glad to be able to be here today. Um, I'm a wildlife biologist with BLM field office in Reading. And uh, Bureau of Land Management purchased the Rancho Briscoe area um, specifically for this project for to uh, re restore riparian habitat uh, on the on the land. And this is one of our highest projects for our field office and has been something we've been working on, as Alden said, uh, for more than 10 years. Uh, phase one of the project will restore 130 acres of uh, mixed riparian habitat. Um, and of course, uh, um, ultimately in the area up to 500 acres of habitat could be restored, uh, which was would be really significant for the North Valley. The importance of riparian habitat uh, to wildlife cannot be overstated and uh, both bird diversity uh, and density are highest uh, in this, this type of habitat. The project will provide, um, will provide a habitat uh, for fifth, more 15 or more uh, state and federal uh, species of special concern, provide uh, uh, additional uh, potential for uh, recovery of five endangered species. Um, and time is of the essence, the faster, the sooner we can uh, get this work done, the better it'll be for the wildlife in, in California and our area. Thank you. Thank you. Jane Dolan with the Sacramento River Forum. Is she online? Jane, you should be able to unmute yourself. I am, and good afternoon. Uh, I am here to speak, or here in Chico, to speak in support. Um, I have been involved uh, 
for a decade more than Julie Rettner in restoration activities and, and advocacy on the Upper Sacramento River, beginning uh, with uh, being on the committee that prepared the Upper Sacramento Fisheries and River Restoration Habitat Plan that was adopted by the Natural Resources Agency and the Band Department of Fish and Game in the 1990s. And it identified this site, this very important site for restoring the harm done by agriculture and other commerce activities in this important area near Battle Creek and the river. Um, I've been part of the advocacy for this. I knew the landowner and helped him to become voluntary landowner to help transfer this land to BLM. Uh, I am incredibly supportive of these projects. I'm not part of the project team, but I am known to give a lot of advice and input. And I just want to end with the fact that I am a wife of a Vietnam veteran who is a victim and has been part of the Agent Orange advocacy for Vietnam veterans. I would never support something that would harm the water, harm the people, or harm the plants. I think this is an excellent project that has been well vetted, well analyzed, and is an important step in improving the ecosystem of this part of Battle Creek and the river. Thank you. Great. You got Todd Manley next with the Northern California Water Association. Todd, you should be able to unmute yourself. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Great, thank you. Um, and thanks all, good afternoon. Um, I am Todd Manley with the Northern California Water Association. And I'm uh, pleased to have the opportunity to speak in support of the Rancho Breezegal Restoration Project. Uh, this project will provide much needed riverside floodplain habitat in the northern end of the Sacramento Valley, which will benefit migratory waterfowl, shorebirds, and other Pacific flyway species, as well as all four runs of Chinook salmon, including the endangered winter run and threatened spring run and Central Valley steelhead. This project has been identified as a priority by the Battle Creek Salmon Recovery Working Group and the Sacramento Valley Salmon Recovery Program. So with that, once again, on behalf of Northern California Water Association and our members, I appreciate the opportunity to support funding for this project. Okay, Maureen Tubert with the Western Shasta RCD. Maureen, you should be able to unmute yourself. Hi, I'm Maureen Tybert. I'm the district manager of the Western Shasta Resource Conservation District, and I really appreciate the opportunity to speak in support of the Rancho Breezegow project today. Um, We've been a partner since the beginning of this. We were part of the planning process and we are the CEQA lead agency for this project. We um, have a long and rich history of partnering um, with the BLM on many, many other projects. Um, and we strongly support um, uh, the restoration that's going to occur if this project is funded. And so um, I just wanted to provide my support today and be able to answer any questions that any of you have um, if needed. Thank you. Great, Danielle Chi with BLM. Danielle, you should be able to unmute yourself. Yes, hi everybody. Um, thank you uh, to the board for the opportunity to comment. I'm Danielle Chi, I'm the Deputy State Director for Resources for BLM California. And not surprisingly, I'm here to voice our uh, support for the, uh, the Rancho Breezegal project. Um, the Sacramento River Bend area has been identified by BLM California as a key landscape. Uh, to focus and prioritize and dedicate our, our resources to in, in coming years. And as um, Alden uh, Neal stated, the projects in this landscape, they have the ability to restore, um, bolster ecosystem function, connect habitats, uh, buffer the impacts of climate change, protect communities from wildfire risks, and, and and also provide sustainable recreation. And so this project would really further the conservation goals we have for this key landscape. Um, and so I just wanted to make sure that uh, you all knew that um, BLM leadership is very, very supportive of this project. So thank you very much for the opportunity to comment. Brooke Thompson with BLM. Hello, my name is Brooke Thompson and I'm an ecologist with the Reading Field Office and I've spent a lot of time at Rancho Breezegal. My first year working for the Reading Field Office, the star thistle was six feet tall. And for a reference, I'm five foot six. Um, in the fields, the star thistle grew so intensely that it fell over into a thatch layer and musk thistle came up behind it in a monoculture. 
Himalayan blackberry, teasel, all kinds of different invasive species, Medusa head are present in these fields in really intense concentrations. Just five miles south of this project area in the Sacramento River Bend, we have some of the highest floristic diversity in our field office. Every year we monitor for monarchs and they come back every year to the same habitat. They're using it. 150 years of intensive agriculture has left this ecosystem, ecosystem unable to restore itself. In our herbicide use plan, we considered every treatment option before we proposed the use of chemicals. They were used routinely on this property for decades before we acquired it in 2011. Our goal is to propose one initial treatment of herbicides with follow-up treatments for problematic weeds to reduce the future need for chemicals on this property um, and to reduce the need for chemicals on adjacent land where weed spread is inevitably spreading. When using herbicides, we implement several standard operating procedures to ensure that risks to human health and the environment are kept to a minimum. I'm happy to discuss these SOPs with anyone on the board. Rancho Breeze Gallon projects like it are how we make a real difference for these species. We have lost 95% of riparian forests in the Central Valley. Over the last 10 years, the BLM has worked with river partners to use the research, write the restoration plans, and analyze any potential impacts to the NEPA process. We have the tools we need to implement this project, and it would be a massive win for several species. Please vote yes on the Rancho Breeze Gow restoration, and let's do it together. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Radley Ott from DWR. Radley, you should be able to unmute yourself. Yes, thank you. Um, good afternoon, Chair and members of the board. My name is Radley Ott. Um, I'm a supervising engineer with the Department of Water Resources in uh, our northern region office located in Red Bluff. Um, I'm also a member of the Battle Creek Working Group. Um, I just want to echo uh, a lot of the support you've heard from other, other partners here this afternoon and just state that uh, this project is consistent with the restoration goals and objectives of the department. And I'm, I'm open to any questions or concerns the, the, the board may have. Thank you. John McLean with Tehama County. John, you should be able to unmute yourself. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is John McLean, and I'm in a project management role at Tehama County. Um, as mentioned earlier, the Rancho Breezegal project area straddles both Shasta and Tehama counties. Um, Tehama County is really supportive of the restoration work as proposed, as well as other future restoration work in the Battle Creek watershed. It'll help support the wildlife and plant species depend on the native habitats that were there. Um, one of the major benefits of the proposed project is that the restoration work will greatly reduce the amount of non-native and invasive species that you heard described earlier in this area and help prevent these infestations from spreading um, to other areas in the county, especially along the Battle Creek corridor. Um, that's all I have. Thank you for the opportunity to offer my support of this important and significant restoration project. Amber Jamison with Klamath River Advocate. Hi there, my name is Amber Jamison and I'm a Klamath Advocate for Environmental Protection Information Center. Um, I want to say that I do support the project's vision to restore the ranch by the ranch land by controlling invasive species and enhancing public land access and improving recreational facilities. But I have concerns for the excessive use of chemical herbicides, including glyphosate, aminopyrrolate, triclofer, and amazepir for the 25 year life of the project. That's very concerning to me, especially when these chemicals are determined to be likely to harm endangered wildlife and their critical habitats. Um, this project is located downstream from two fish hatcheries, and one of them is just three miles away and includes the chemical herbicide treatments to riparian habitat adjacent to these salmon bearing streams. CDFW is spending millions of dollars in the Battle Creek reintroduction plan for winter rung Chinook that occur in Battle Creek immediately adjacent to the project location. I'm concerned about the large quantity of herbicides that'll be used with vehicle mounted spraying of granular and liquids in the project area and the effects that they'll have on threatened and endangered Chinook salmon and other wildlife. 
it's my understanding that this area has already been um, farm and ag land, and I don't understand why it can't be tilled under and then replanted with something like ryegrass and then replanted with natives. Um, if this project is approved, I'd request any kind of, as much monitoring of pe pesticide presence as possible and an exit plan for not using pesticides for the entire 25 year lifespan of the project. I also wanted to comment on Mr. Bonham's request to restrict public comments on or to restrict comments on glyphosate and just wanted to say that that is um, not really an appropriate thing under the um, for for you to be able to restrict a board member's commenting on herbicides. Thank you. Uh, David Webb. David, you should be able to unmute yes. yourself. Thank you. Uh, I think I can say that I am really glad and heartened to see this land purchase now being followed up with uh, subsequent environmental restoration uh, adjacent to such a really glorious stretch of the Sacramento River and Battle Creek. And so I also really support this project. I think you can generalize from my Aliso Creek comments, kind of my thoughts on herbicide use, so I won't repeat them. Um, I will say though that um, And arguably, it looks like uh, with this project site, we are stepping onto a, a very long-term treadmill of herbicide usage. And I think it's, it's a situation where hopefully in the future, there'll be similar restoration projects and similar soils along the Sacramento River. And it'd be really nice if part of the project, granted will cost more, could include some focused experimentation efforts to try to find ways to reduce that $18 million hand cost for future projects that we can at least stepwise be backing off from quite so much chemical controls. I'm also concerned that there seem to be a focus on herbicides that have long-term persistence. And I wonder just how the native plants are gonna gain a foothold in a soil environment with, with long-term herbicide persistence in the soil itself. I, I presume from the, the comments from the BLM that, that has been well thought of, just couldn't be included into the relatively brief summary. So other than that, I appreciate uh, this project. I appreciate being funded. And I thank you all for, for hearing my thoughts. Thank you. And Kian Shulman. Yes, thank you. Distinguished board members, I'm Keon Schulman, Director of Poison Free Malibu. I have the same comments I had for this item as I have stated. This project have included other pesticides, not just glyphosate that is damaging to our environment and health. Roundup glyphosate has virtually wiped out milkweed plants across the nation. It's estimated that in the past 20 years, these once common butterflies have lost more than 165 million acres of habitat. The acre the area about the size of Texas due to pesticides and loss of breeding grounds. The proposed pesticides in this project includes aminopyrrolid and emopur that have been detected in our groundwater. There are 43 research papers that these poisons are associated with toxic fish and aquatic organisms and 43 research papers associated with bee toxicity. Please do not allow toxic chemical pesticides to be used in restoration projects. There is no excuse to use toxic chemical pesticides for restoration projects. Thank you. Okay, yeah, that's the speaker cards I have. Alexa, are there other hands raised? We have one additional raised hand. Rebecca, you should now be able to unmute yourself. Good afternoon. I'm Rebecca Casey. I'm the project manager at North State Planning and Development Collective, which is an academic center at California State University of Chico. And um, I just dialed in today. I want to share our support for the Rancho Breezegow Riparian Habitat Restoration Project, and I can do so on behalf of our Salmon Habitat Restoration Partnership. Um, this partnership includes River Partners, Sacramento River Forum, 
Department of Water Resources, those folks you heard today, and the university, as well as others. And um, these folks all co-signed a letter of support for this project. Um, we in particular have several aquatic habitat restoration projects that are planned for lands adjacent to the project area. And from our vantage point, this riparian restoration project enhances the value of the work that we're doing under the near-term restoration strategy of the Central Valley Project Improvement Act. That is to say that uh, we're working together to create a network of high quality salmon rearing and spawning habitat on the upper Sacramento River. Uh, we see this proposal as a complementary terrestrial and aquatic habitat restoration, a partnership that can restore land at a scale that hasn't been possible at the other restoration sites that I'm involved with um, on the Upper River. Um, and this year, we see salmon habitat restoration critical more so um, as our ocean populations are diminished and we've closed the California fishery this year. So I wanted to call in and urge the board to consider funding this important project. And I appreciate your time and taking my comment. Okay, we have one more in the room. Come up. Hi, my name is Helen Swaggerty. I'm a director of grants at River Partners. And I wanna say that I started off my career doing habitat restoration in the year 2000. So I've seen a long trajectory of how these uh, restoration projects have been designed and implemented. I've done, since 1998, River Partners has implemented over 20,000 acres. It's a huge impact statewide. And if we look back, some of the points that we heard today was, and I wanna clarify, is that we're not, we're not proposing that herbicides are used in treatments of these restoration projects for the life, for the, for the 25 year lifespan that's in a lot of these agreements. What we were asking for today is funding to establish a habitat and using some tools for a temporary period, which is three to five years. In this case, it's three years. Um, once River Partners completes the restoration projects, we transfer that um, maintenance responsibility back to either a state or federal agency. In this case, it would be BLM. And they are responsible for maintaining the habitat value for that span of 25 years. We can look at some of the projects that you have awarded over the last 20 something years. And I encourage that the board reach out and talk to the land managers who have the responsibility, the perpetual responsibility of maintaining these habitats and see whether or not their practices include herbicides. I would like to probably guess that a lot of it is just mechanical treatment because of the short temporary use of herbicides, we're able to establish a really strong overstory and understory that can help reduce the reinvasion of these invasive plants. Um, so I encourage you to help with your education, maybe reach out to partners. We are willing and always um, accommodating to take anyone out to our restoration projects to see what the practices are involved in establishing these projects and looking at um, projects that have you know reached the 15, 20 year mark and see what, what it's like what your investment has given and what management burdens it has placed on long-term man property managers. Thank you. Alexa, any more hands? We have one additional raised hand. Krista Hoffman, you should be able to unmute. Hi, thank you. Appreciate you letting me um, take the time to comment. Um, I am Krista Hoffman. I am CDFW's Integrated Pest Management Coordinator. I have a background in ecology and ecotoxicology. I'm a past president of NorCal, NorCal Society, uh, chapter of the Society for Environmental Toxicology and Chemistry. And I am the current co-lead of the Interagency Ecological Programs Contaminants Project Work Team. I have a strong interest in toxic chemicals and their impacts on humans and non-target species. Um, it's what I studied as my PhD research at UC Davis. Um, but I will say that as mentioned by the Xerces representative presenting on item 21, the relative risk of glyphosate and other herbicides compared to that of other toxic pesticides in the environment, especially insecticides and other contaminants is very low. The habitat benefits of using this tool to enhance the efficacy and efficiency of habitat restoration and the resulting benefits to species and habitat largely outweighs the minimal risk that these chemicals pose. Eliminating herbicides from the restoration toolbox would delay the restoration process by years, possibly a decade or more, a time delay that impacts species and habitat itself, 
and can make projects like this infeasible. I want to briefly address the board, board member Phillips' concern with the, and others' concern with regard to herbicide runoff to waterways under this project. EPA and the Water Board evaluate the impacts of pesticides in waterways, and two of the primary herbicides under this project, Amazapir and Triclopyr, are both registered for direct application to waterways and are considered safe for aquatic species up to quite high concentrations. There, these two products have the highest national pollutant discharge elimination system allowable concentrations in waterways among all of the aquatic registered project, products out there. That indicates that these are among the safest products for use around water. I also want to briefly address some of the concerns around the use of glyphosate. Many of you might be aware that there's a significant body of evidence showing that it is actually the surfactants in the formulation of mixture of glyphosate that are primarily responsible for the non-target toxicity of glyphosate products. There's so a lot can you please wrap up your comments? I'm sorry, we exceeded the two minute. Time frame. Oh yeah, you got it. Yeah. I just have a few, couple more sentences. There's a long history of Monsanto and now Bayer adding toxic surfactants to their Roundup formulations. And despite there being strong evidence that these additives significantly enhance the toxicity, those adjuvants remain. However, there are glyphosate-based products that do not contain those toxic ingredients. And so which formulation is being proposed should be a major, major consideration in any restoration project and one that's often overlooked. So I, I really highly support, I think it is of All utmost right. importance that we maintain this highly efficient, effective tool for restoration projects. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Any other comments uh, from the public? There are no additional raised hands. Great. Any comments, questions from the board before we I, I ask for a, a motion? Quick comment, maybe yes. an ingestion. Sure. Oh, sorry. Is it someone? So, no, oh, okay. It's a minor one. Those of you, uh, Director Bonham and uh, Catherine, as well as Damon, yes. Damon uh, that are on the uh, working group board. I think uh, what was brought up by one of the previous speakers is important. Is this a 25 year application or uh, you, you would think, I'm not an expert on this. It's a old walnut farm of 130 or 140 acres. You wanna eradicate the uh, invasive plants. It'd be several years of applications. But if you would look at how you transition or, or does it, is it open-ended for 25 years to continue using that? Or are there some approaches, incentives, or information that could help facilitate uh, the reduction of use of that after you make sure that you've established a less invasive plant species on this particular property? Just right. add to the committees. It's like right. So Thank you for the suggestion. And I think this topic does go to the subcommittee. And, you know, apologies to the commenter who thought I sought to limit any board member's opinion prior. I think this agenda item proves we, we, we're going to take the time any board member wants. I just think at a process level, I'd ask the subcommittee with staff to think through process. I don't think we're helping the overall agenda we need to get through for each meeting. And I wonder if there are other procedural ways like projects that may involve application of these tools, could they be grouped on the agenda? Could we also think about managing our workflow for purposes of getting through you know, 30 to 50 items in each, each agenda? I think that could be kind of also topic in the subgroup. Thank you for that. Um, any additional comments, questions from the board? Yeah, Catherine. So um, my preference, of course, would just not to put these items on the agenda, uh, bring items on, forward only that don't use glyphosate. Um, I appreciate the comments of all of the presenters and, and the folks coming down from the speakers. Um, this is not an easy topic, but, you know, in, in answer to your, uh, to what you were mentioning, Fran, you know, 25 years, 
is a long time. Uh, it's about a third of a human life. Um, three years is not that long in human terms, but it can be a couple of generations of an amphibian's life or a couple of generations in an amphibian. So three years can be a long time. Um, I have had an opportunity to go out and see some of the projects that River Partners has done. You do good work. Um, there's no doubt about that. You're also taking on a really big job in that you're doing large scale um, habitat restoration in severely damaged lands, um, things that a lot of people wouldn't touch. Uh, because of that, it seems to me that you're in a perfect position to look for, to advertise, to help bring folks together about alternatives to those things that we know are harmful. And I would hope that the discussions we've been having here are pushing you to reconsider your business model in a way that, you know, it's, there's probably somewhere between, you know, a few million and 18 million that you can get to, to do more mechanical controls, especially in consultation with the few large scale um, land managers out there who may be doing non-pesticide use and controls. So, you know, I hope you can get to that point. Um, in this project, this project is not unusual in the sense that we don't get very much information by the time it comes to us. The staff knows a whole lot more than we do. I find it a little bit frustrating because of that, because I, I'd like to know, and there isn't time to discuss this without, you know, we'd be here for days, but I'd like to know more about where are you going to be putting the, the um, herbicides? How how are you staggering it? Is there are the herbicides just going to be, you know, uh, two acres away from from the the riparian area, and within two acres of the riparian area, there's nothing going on. Um, if in fact the land is flat, are you at a, a a high or low water table? These are things that I would hope the staff is asking, and um, I'm talking to the staff now about that. I just want you all to be really sensitive to the long-term goal of reducing or eliminating the use of pesticides in these wildland areas. Um, there is a limited, there is an unlimited amount of research out there. It's coming out on a constant basis that shows that pesticides across the board, but glyphosate particularly, because that's the one that I read mostly about, does cause problems for a range of invertebrates and vertebrates. And we aren't doing on these restoration projects the kind of specific analysis. We don't have the money to do the specific analysis on all of these to see what is and isn't being affected. Uh, that's up for you know the academic institutions or some researchers to do. So in order to be safest and to cause the least amount of harm, I feel that we as a public agency representing the public should not be funding projects that have that include the use of herbicides. All of that being said, I don't think any of us, and it would be the rare person that would say you should not increase or improve the, the habitat at this rancho. Um, and it's not the project that is the problem. It's the way certain aspects of the prob the project are gonna go forward. And so for me, that that's a problem. And I, again, I think some of the folks who have testified on this item and uh, item 18 who are concerned about the application of herbicides have said it better than I have. So thank you. Thank you. Any other comments, questions from the board? Okay, I'll entertain a motion. Make a motion to approve the project as proposed by staff. Is there a second? I'll second. 
Okay, we have a first and a second. Any final comments, questions from the board? Okay, Mary, can you please take the roll? The vote, sorry. <laughs> Chair vote day. Uh, yes. Vice Chair Bonham. Yes. Board Member Nagami. Yes. Board Member Pavley. Yes. Board Member Peral. Yes. Board Member Phillips. No. Board Member Scalar. I believe he has left the meeting. Thank you. Okay. Motion uh, carries. So I'd like to propose to the board that we take a 20 minute, 15, 20 minute break. You're going to let us get something to eat. Yes. <laughs> uh so how's 20 minutes uh just to yeah rest your break get some food um it is now 122 how about we reconvene at 145 and then i think just for the board and and the public we are going to be agendaizing a lunch break because given these meetings do go <laughs> all day uh just so folks can also plan their schedule accordingly so um okay so we'll reconvene at 145 thank you All right, I'm going to go ahead and call the meeting back to order. Do we need Mary or oh, we're okay? Okay. All right, so we are going to uh, move now to item 26 on the agenda, and I will hand it off to Rebecca. Okay, item 26 is the Oroville Wildlife Area Thermolito Recreation Improvements going to Sutter Butte Flood Control Agency and Kara Allen of our staff will present this item. Oh, it doesn't seem like it's on the green. Alexa, we need a green, green going on the uh, dais, please. Thank you. There you go. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> agenda item 26 is a proposal for a grant to the Sutter Butte Flood Control Agency for a cooperative project with DWR, CDFW, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to expand and enhance public access opportunities at the Thermalita Afterbay Outlet Unit of the Oroville Wildlife Area, located about 20 miles south of Chico and 20 miles north of Yuba City. Um, along the Feather River, just downstream of Lake Oroville. Uh, Lake Oroville is the second largest reservoir in California and is a hydroelectric component of the Oroville Facilities FERC project, which includes the 12,000 acre wildlife area uh, that is managed by CDFW for boating, fishing, hunting, camping, and hiking. 
uh, if you look closely at the map, it shows um, the perimeters of three catastrophic wildfires that burned over 1.4 million acres of land to the north and east of Lake Oroville, uh, displacing many families and whole communities and damaging several recreational facilities in the region. Next slide. So over the last 50 years, uh, WCB has funded 14 projects in the immediate area that have helped shape and um, uh, acquire the Oroville Wildlife Area for wildlife-oriented recreation. And the uh, left map shows some of the more recent development projects we have funded um, that have improved salmon habitat, restored waterfowl and migratory bird habitat, and provided non-motorized boat access and fishing piers along the Feather River, which all add value to this area and attract more people to it. Uh, the center and right maps are from DWR and Cal Enviro screen and show that the project is in a severely disadvantaged community, according to DWR data and is in the top 20, 25 percentile of Cal EPA's indicators for a disadvantaged community. Next slide. Uh, so this project is a top priority for CDFW's North Central Region because it will enhance one of the most active shoreline and boat accessible fishing areas in Northern California. And it's equally important to DWR because it is serving a regional recreation need. Um, that is identified in their recreation management plan for the Oroville Facilities FERC relicensing project. Although the site does get a high level of use, especially during the fall salmon season, it offers extremely primitive and unimproved facilities and does not use the space to its fullest potential, as the pictures on this slide show, um, which does limit the enjoyment of this riverfront property um, and its accessibility for people with limited mobility. Next slide. This is a rough schematic of the proposed improvements, which include paving the access road and staging areas, constructing a double wide paved boat launch and floating dock for motorized boats, and converting the existing gravel boat launch into a non-motorized boat launch that will provide some separation and safety when these two boating groups are launching at the same time. Uh, the paved boat launch will be designed with low river stages in mind to keep this facility open during <clears throat> uh, low flow and drought conditions. Uh, the large open field that you saw on the previous slide uh, will be developed to a primitive campground that will have 25 campsites with two ADA sites and will be landscaped with native trees to provide shade for campers and habitat for wildlife, uh, particularly the birds that use the large pond behind the proposed campground. Uh, Multi-language interpretive panels will be designed and installed that interpret the history of the site in constructing the Lake Oroville Dam, which is the largest earthen dam in the United States. Um, and other panel content may include the site's natural history and common wildlife uh, that will be installed along the new Riverside Trail that will connect the uh, improved day use area with the 44 mile Brad Freeman Trail that circles the Oroville area. The day use area and campground will each be equipped with accessible bathroom facilities, picnic tables and trash receptacles uh, to keep the area clean, safe and enjoyable for all users. Next slide. So this project will expand and formalize the outdoor recreation along the Feather River by constructing accessible boating, fishing, and camping facilities, creating a safe and reliable launching facility for all boating groups, and making the site more durable and sustainable in acclimate weather and times of heavy use. Uh, these new facilities will be open year round and managed under an existing agreement between DWR and CDFW, with CDFW continuing their role as stewards and public safety officers of the project area. Uh, this project will benefit disadvantaged communities by adding new and improved recreation facilities to the region that are free of charge for day use activities and overnight camping. Uh, we have several folks with us today from the Sutter Butte Flood Control Agency, CDFW, and DWR that can help answer any questions you have. Thank you. Great, thank you. Are there any questions 
comments from the board? Okay, do we have any public comments? Alexa, do we have any hands raised? There are no raised hands. Okay, uh, do I have a board motion? Great, is there a second? Okay, second, check. All right, Mary, you wanna take the vote? <clears throat> Chair Bupte? Uh Yes. Vice Chair Bonham? Board Member Nagami? Board Member Pavley? Yes. Board Member Phillips? Yes. Great. Um, the motion passes. Thank you. All right, we'll move on to item number 27. Great. Uh, so number 27 is Upper Rose Bar Restoration Construction for the South Yuba River Citizen League and Aaron Heyman from our WCB staff will be presenting. Thank you, Rebecca. Madam Chair, members of the board, good afternoon. Next slide, please. This proposal is to consider the allocation of $4,081,000 in funds for an implementation grant to the South Yuba River Citizens League to carry out a project that will add gravel to existing riffles in the Yuba River to increase spawning and rearing habitat for salmonids on approximately a 43 acre site in Yuba County. Next slide. This map shows locations of the existing riffles at the upstream and downstream uh, ends of the project and the sites of future benches which I will discuss momentarily for spawning and rearing. Next slide. So here's a photograph of the project area. A and B represent the locations of the existing riffles. This project will add gravel to substantially increase the area of these riffles and so provide more area of suitable spawning habitat within the river, river channel. C here indicates the location of the proposed steel spawning bench so specifically targeting steelhead. Um, and D is the proposed location of a bench suitable for the rearing of juvenile salmonids so they can grow before traveling downriver. Next slide. The source of the scrabble for this project is gonna be from on site. It will come from the eroding gully that also will serve as a site for the access road, which will allow the whole project to be installed which is what you see right here, right alongside uh, feeding into the previous picture. Next slide. All this gravel comes from mining tailings, which have moved down a slope, uh, sort of downstream from a large mine just uphill and has accumulated into a deep layer of relatively unstable materials. These materials will be excavated, as I said, as part of the construction of that access road, and then will be sorted to allow for the selection of appropriately sized gravel, specifically for Chinook and steelhead spawning. Next slide. Staff recommends that board, the board approve this project as proposed. In the audience in person are Aaron Zellerman and Danielle Conway from the South Yuba River Citizens League, the applicant, and also Jeff Matthews from the Yuba County Water Agency, the landowner. I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions from the board or comments? Catherine? Yeah, I'm, this is a, my understanding is the South Yuba River Citizens League is a fairly small organization. And this is a pretty large grant. Um, have we, how, how prepared are they or, oh, there you are, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, thank you. I think I can speak to that well. My name is Aaron Zetlerman. I'm the interim executive director at the South Yuba River Citizens League, also known as Circle, and also the watershed science director. So we uh, certainly by name are a relatively small organization and our roots are humble and small 40 years ago. But at this point, we're pretty large and we work throughout the Yuba watershed. So this is one of three lower Yuba salmon focused restoration projects that we are at some portion of planning or implementation. 
We finished the construction of lower long bar restoration project, which was about a 42 acre salmon rearing habitat project, November of 2022, also in partnership with Yuba Water Agency. Uh, the WCB is funding our design and permitting process for the upper long bar restoration project, which is going to be up to about 100 acres of rearing partners, uh, rearing habitat, also in partnership with Yuba Water Agency. We're part of the very large, one of the signatories, North Yuba Forest Partnership, as well, working on forest health focused in the North Yuba, as well as the Van Norden Restoration Project up in the headwaters of the South Yuba near Sugar Bowl and Boreal. We're also the lead implementer and sort of project proponent there, which is a massive 480-ish acre meadow restoration, as well as additional meadow restoration in the North Yuba. So, you know, relatively small staff, but we've been doing big projects for quite a while. Okay, small but mighty. Yes. Thank and, you. And Catherine, the, I think, Aaron, a grantee of the department as well for some of that restoration work. So it, it's a yeah. relationship that runs in multiple funding ways. <laughs> yep. Uh, Van Norden and Upper Long Bar have both received funding and are in implementation from WCB. Great. Damon? Yeah, just a quick question. Um, seems like a great project. Um, the uh, mining tailings, I assume this was covered by CEQA, but are, are, is there any toxicity or contamination in those tailings? And if so, how are they, how is that dealt with? Yep. <laughs> yeah, so it, it is mine tailings. This is endemic to the lower Yuba River. It's all mine tailings, so there is mercury. We've done extensive testing of the sediment that we'll be excavating part of the process is to remove sort and clean and that before we place in the channel and then during construction and as part of our post project monitoring we'll also be watching those uh toxicity levels from mercury but really it's to make sure that there isn't any before it goes back in the water and then as part of the restoration project the fine sediments which is what that mercury uh, binds to particulate bound mercury We'll be planting and doing some revegetation to make sure that that fine material doesn't leave the site uh, prior to wrapping up in the fall. Thank you. All right. Are there any public comment cards? Erin, did you want to speak? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Welcome back. So I wanted to thank the board, the chair, for giving me the opportunity to talk about this project a little bit more, and I want to really situate it as part of a broader vision for the Yuba watershed in general. This project really helps support projects that I've mentioned already that we've recently completed at Lower Long Bar and the Hallwood project. It also is in direct support and will directly benefit from the Upper Long Bar project, which we're in the design and permitting phase of, funded by the Wildlife Conservation Board. And it's also going to very directly benefit from the recently proposed fish passage projects at Daguerre Point Dam, which we look forward to being partner with and continuing to work with YWA on that project and all of the projects in the Lower Yubo River, which we're actively collaborating on. Thank you. Alexa, do we have any hands online? There are no raised hands. All right. Um, motion from the board. I'll make a motion to approve item number 27. Great. Thank you. Is there a second? A second. Great. Second by Catherine. We'll take the vote. Chair Bokde? Yes. Vice Chair Bonham? Board Member Nagami? Yes. Board Member Pavley? Yes. Board Member Phillips? Yes. All right, motion passes. Um, we are now moving on to item 28 on the agenda. <clears throat> okay, item 28, Sonoma Creek Baylands Planning, and that's going to Ducks Unlimited. Uh, we'll have Kurt Malchow of our staff present this one. Thank you. This proposal is to consider the allocation for a grant to Ducks Unlimited for a cooperative project with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the Sonoma Land Trust, the Sonoma County Sanitation District, USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service, and California State Coastal Conservancy to develop shovel-ready plans and environmental compliance documentation for up to 6,000 acres of the Sonoma Creek Baylands in Sonoma County. Next slide, please. 
Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, the Sonoma Creek Baylands, located along the northern extent of San Francisco Bay, was once a vast 50,000 acre network of tidal and seasonal wetlands that delivered fresh water, sediment, and nutrients to San Pablo Bay and supported abundant and diverse wildlife. The Swampland Act of 1850 started an era of reclamation, and more than 80% of San Pablo Bay's wetlands were transformed into agricultural baylands and managed wetlands. Levee construction and draining has caused a dramatic loss of tidal marsh habitat and has created a significant sediment trap in the historic channels. The whole area is now dependent upon levees and pumping to dry out land for agricultural uses and to prevent flooding in times of heavy or prolonged rainfall. These challenges will worsen with accelerating climate-driven sea level rise and increased storm frequency and intensity. And at the same time, this large agricultural landscape provides an unparalleled opportunity for large-scale tidal marsh ecosystem restoration. To begin addressing this situation, a flood management and ecosystem enhancement study for Lower Sonoma Creek was completed in 2012, which identified a broader watershed-wide approach as providing more significant flood reduction and habitat restoration opportunities. Subsequently, the Sonoma Creek Bayland strategy completed last year builds on the recommendations of that study and outlines a plan for landscape scale restoration, flood protection, and public access in the Sonoma Creek Baylands. Next slide. This project seeks to implement the Sonoma Creek Bayland strategy as well as other planning efforts by producing shovel ready plans and environmental permitting for up to 6,000 acres of lower Sonoma Creek Baylands. This will be accomplished primarily through five project components, project management and travel coordination, outreach to gain community and stakeholder buy-in, production of engineering designs and environmental compliance documentation ready for implementation projects, and site monitoring to inform future restoration. Additional project goals include identifying public access opportunities in resilient locations within or adjacent to the restored lands and maintaining or improving the existing level of flood protection for remaining infrastructure. Next slide. This image highlights the subject properties under this planning effort going south to north, Skaggs Island, the largest parcel owned by US Fish and Wildlife Service at over 3,000 acres. Hare Ranch, also under US Fish and Wildlife Service ownership, is part of the San Pablo Bay National Wildlife Refuge and is a little over 1,000 acres. Camps four and five together covering about 1,400 acres are under contract for purchase by Sonoma Land Trust. Also included are two Sonoma Valley County Sanitation District parcels totaling 370 acres. Next slide. These are some images of the parcels. The upper and lower right-hand images show the Sonoma Valley County Sanitation District parcels seasonally inundated with visitation by waterfowl and the lower right showing where the Bay Trail comes out along the property edge. The lower left shows Hare Ranch, where invasive plants are prevalent across the historically farmed landscape, and finally Skaggs Island in the upper left, where the levee often overtops at high tides. Next slide. Following years of study and region scale planning, this project will complete the design and environmental compliance needed to bring about restoration that integrates natural processes, maximizes estuarine habitat, incorporates upland and watershed connectivity, connects important marsh migration zones, and increases their resilience to climate change and sea level rise. Staff recommends that the Wildlife Conservation Board approve the project as proposed. Dr. Renee Spence, San Francisco Bay and California Coast Regional Biologist, and Kate Freeman, Biologist, both with Ducks Unlimited, and Melissa Amato, Refuge Manager for the San Pablo Bay National Wildlife Refuge, are joining us to address any questions. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, are there any questions, comments from the board? One comment, one question. Um, I noticed that you did put in here that this is part of the uh, groundwater basin for the area as a high priority one for DWR. So yeah, in the full I agenda. Yeah. Keep trying to connect those dots there. But I was curious, who is actually the property owner in San Pablo Bay? I couldn't figure that out. Uh, that's that's there's quite a few components there. If I could have uh, well, Renee, uh, if you could help uh, out. Uh, who's the property <laughs> owner and who's going to manage it? I guess that's the two questions. Oh, eventually, once restored. Yeah, that's 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 another good question. I'd like to go ahead and defer to the grantee. It's <laughs> a lot of parcels there, so um, yeah, a lot I of just, eventual implementation right. projects. That's why there was probably no answer. Well, coastal conservancy, perhaps, or something. Yeah. 
Thank you for the question. It's super exciting to be able to put together a project of this magnitude and significance, and we really thank you for considering it. So in terms of land ownership, there are multiple landowners involved in this project. So U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and Pablo Bay Refuge owns the Skaggs Island and Hare Ranch units. As uh, Kurt mentioned, the um, Leveroni parcel and Camp 5 parcels are currently privately owned. Sonoma Land Trust is in the process of acquiring them. And Natural Resources Conservation Service is in the process of acquiring easements on those properties. And then the Sanitation District owns those two northernmost parcels. And so in terms of how they will be managed, the anticipation is that at least the majority of this land will be tidally restored and will require fairly minimal management. But all of them, if that tidal restoration planning goes forward, would be hydrologically connected. And, you know, because these are very subsided lands, the planning really needs to start at the bay and move up Sonoma Creek because of the tidal prism that we would have to consider as we look at each one of these parcels. Any other questions? Well, you're comments? here. I think the answer is yes. I just want to confirm that the project partners and the grant recipient will be doing tribal consultation, including with the Federated Indians of Graden Rancheria, correct? Thank you so much for asking that. So we have actually already invited the Federated Indians of Graden Rancheria to have a seat at the planning table. They're considering that request and they will certainly be involved. I believe there are about five or six tribes that came up through the NRCS consultation process in, a, in their, um, their easement consideration. And so we'll be doing independent reach, uh, outreach to each one of those tribes and making the same offer to them and engaging them at whatever level they would like. Great, any other questions? Uh, do we have any speaker cards? No? no. Okay. Alexa, any hands raised? There are no raised hands. All right. I'll I'll obtain with approval if you're entertaining Great. a motion. Yes. Is there a second? I'll second. <laughs> Great. All right. Let's take a vote. Chair Bokde? Yes. Vice Chair Bonham? Board Member Nagami? Yes. Board Member Pavley? Yes. Board Member Phillips? Yes. Great. Um, motion passes. We're moving on to item number 29. Okay, let's head over to Mono County and hear about Bentley Junction Ranch. Bentley Junction Ranch. Brian Gibson from WCB will present this item. Thank you again, Rebecca. Uh, Bentley Junction Ranch is located approximately 17 miles northwest of Bridgeport near the in intersection of US 395 and State Route 108, commonly referred to as Sonora Junction. The area falls within the lower western slopes of the Sweetwater mountain range that straddles the Nevada and California border. Next slide, please. The 2,330 Three acre property is traversed by the West Walker River, the Little Walker River, and Junction Creek, and also encompasses Junction Reservoir. Next slide, please. The property mostly consists of high Sierra sagebrush and scrub rangeland areas with expansive wet meadow inclusions that provide essential year round habitat for greater sage grouse. The property also provides important migration, holdover, summer range, and fawning habitat for mule deer herds. Next slide. The California Department of Fish and Wildlife Fisheries Program has prepared the Walker River Lahontan Cutthroat Trout Brewstock Management Plan for Hot Creek Hatchery and Junction Reservoir, de detailing plans to raise threatened Walker River Lahontan Cutthroat Trout on the property in the Junction Reservoir, which is presently used by CDFW to raise rainbow trout under a lease agreement. Acquisition of the property will advance multiple Walker Lahontan Cutthroat Trout recovery objectives, including establishing a new lake population of Walker, River Lahontan cutthroat trout, improving the genetic management of the species for recreation and conservation, and providing a reliable egg take location for genetically pure Lahontan cutthroat trout to assist the recovery goals without, without having to take fish from current populations. And this is a, a Bentley 
uh, uh, reservoir where the hot and cutthroat trout will be raised. Uh, next slide, please. The property lies within the approved CFW Bircham and Willow Flats conceptual area of protection plan. The CAP identifies several priority properties near the Bircham and Willow Flats wildlife area for protection and conservation of habitat important to greater sage grouse, a California species of special concern. Uh, next slide, please. The property will be managed and owned by the Wildlands Conservancy as a part of its two rivers reserve with outdoor education, recreational angling, nature viewing and hiking opportunities available for free to the general public. The Wildlands Conservancy will also work with CDFW to develop a CDFW approved long-term management plan for the property. As part of this project, the Wildlands Conservancy will also be granting an easement to CDFW to continue its fishery activities at Junction Reservoir. The uh, praise, TGS approved appraises value is 5,250,000. Uh, the landowner has agreed to sell for 5,200,000. And in the audience is Aaron Johnson uh, via Zoom. Uh, he's the senior environmental scientist, Region 6. Fraser Haney, executive director of Wildlands Conservancy. Landon Peppel, deputy director of conservation, uh, Wildlands Conservancy. And John Trammell, he's the Eastern Sierra Regional Director with the Wildlands Conservancy. That's it. Thank you. Sure. Um, any questions, comments from the board? Okay. Are there I, any speakers? I know just oh. a little bit about the Wildlands Conservancy because I'm starting to hear their name more and more yeah, and it, they can Maybe Fraser. Yeah, if we can have Fraser come on up. Yeah, we, have, we do have a speaker card for Fraser Haney. Where they're based. In... Yeah. Good, good afternoon, uh, Fraser Haney, Executive Director at the Wildlands Conservancy. I just want to start by saying thank you to the Wildlife Conservation Board for considering uh, granting us funds for the acquisition of the of the Bentley Junction Ranch. Uh, and the next agenda item is the Rana Creek Ranch. I also want to say thank you to uh, the staff at the Wildlife Conservation Board for all their hard work in, in bringing this to bear and our partners at CDFW. Uh, this preserve will be added to our Two Rivers Preserve and be open to the public free of charge like all of the preserves in the preserve system uh, and provide the hiking opportunities that Brian had outlined. Happy to answer any questions. So what is the Wildlands Conservancy? We're a 501c3 nonprofit. Uh, we're the largest nonprofit preserve system in the state of California. Uh, we've recently acquired a property in Oregon as well, and we're working on one in Utah. We were founded in 1995 in Southern California. So uh, you have the Wind Wolves Preserve? Yeah, that's right. Oh, okay. Wind Wolves is our, our yeah. largest preserve. I know who you are. Good. <laughs> Any other questions, comments? All right, any speaker cards? Yeah, we also have one for uh, John, John Trammell. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is John Trammell. I'm the Eastern Sierra Nevada Regional Director for the Wildlands Conservancy. I just wanted to express our gratitude to the Wildlife Conservation Board for supporting this rare opportunity to protect a remarkable landscape that holds important conservation and public access values. I would also like to extend a thanks to the California Department of Fish and Wildlife for their critical leadership and support in developing this project. We are excited to expand our existing Two Rivers Preserve to include the Bentley Junction Ranch, which will protect vital habitat that supports key species, such as the bi-state sage grouse, provide a location for the state to operate a broodstock for the threatened Lahontan cutthroat trout, welcome to the public to explore and connect with the natural world, and much, much more. I have this, I hope that this is the first of many projects we work together in the Eastern Sierra Nevada. Thank you. Okay, I also have a card for Lynn Bolton. <laughs> is Lynn Bolton online, Alexa? Yes, she should be able to unmute herself now. Yes, hi, greetings. 
Um, I'm the chair of the Ranger Light Group of the Sierra Club that covers Mona County, where the Bentley Junction Ranch property is located. And I'd like to point out that this project can really help the bi-state sage grouse, which is a candidate threatened species. So besides being a stunningly scenic gateway to the Eastern Sierra, the property is good sage grouse habitat. And there's a lot of riparian habitat, as you can tell from the photos um, with the little Walker River flowing through it. And that improves sage grouse chick survival rates. Um, generates a lot of insects and that that's them up and improves their survival rate. The Wheeler Flat Leck is just to the south of the parcel and its um, population declined some during the 2018 boot fire, but it is still an active lek. And according to the 2012 Bi-State Sage Grouse Action Plan, urbanization is one of the highest risks to the to this population. The, Desert Creek Vales Population Management Unit. So the development of even the few houses that are in the area have had a significant impact on the lex. But the, so the habitat can come back after a wildfire, but not from development. Um, so a lot has been done in the area to support sage grouse over the years. Restoration work has been done along Wheeler Creek. The surrounding property has small parcels that California Fish and Wildlife has purchased for the benefit of the sage grouse. So adding this parcel would be a significant addition to their range and um, provide some linkage from the pine nuts to the Bodie Hills. So thank you. Thanks. Also, um, Allison Weber with Friends of the Inyo. Hello, my name is Allison Weber. Uh, as mentioned, I'm with Friends of the Inyo. I'm their forest and water campaign manager. And we also support um, this wonderful acquisition project. Adding uh, this piece of land in Mono County, uh, which is in our working area, also as a 501c3 nonprofit uh, working in conservation across the Eastern Sierra. Um, two of the Two Rivers Preserve would be a really awesome way to uh, protect not only the riparian habitat and all of this um, great sagebrush for the bi-state sage grouse, mule deer, stop over species who are migrating. It would also uh, help kind of uplift 30 by 30 goals in Mono County and in this more eastern rural part of the state uh, and add to that greater patchwork of conservation efforts that we all need to kind of pull together to make 30 by 30 happen. So I think this would be a great opportunity for the Wildlife Conservation Board to kind of get involved in this part of the state um, and see some good happen in Mono County. So we want to just express our support and uh, thank the Wildlands Conservancy for the great work they're doing over here. Great, thank you. Um, any additional comments, questions from the board? All right. Uh, anyone want to entertain a board motion? I'll move to approve the item. Great. Great. We have a second. Let's take the roll call. Sorry. Yeah. Ch Chuck seconded. Chair Boke? Uh Yes. Chair Vice Chair Bonham. Board Member Nagami. Yes. Board Member Pavley. Yes. Board Member Phillips. Yes. Sorry, keep waiting for <laughs> the other board member. Sorry for Eric. Um, so uh, the motion passes. Congratulations. Um, we are now moving on to item <clears throat> number 30. Great, yes, let's move into Monterey County. We have number 30, Rana Creek Ranch, and Jason Yee uh, is remotely coming in to tell us about this project. Uh, thanks, Rebecca. Um, good afternoon, board members. Uh, this proposed grant, along with cooperative funding from the State Coastal Conservancy, will support the Wildlands Conservancy with the acquisition of 11,691 acres of overall 14,000 acre property known as Rana Creek Ranch, identified as the largest land holding in Carmel Valley. The property lies between Salinas Valley to the east and the Santa Lucia Mountain Range to the west and is approximately 16 miles directly south of the city of Salinas and 14 miles inland from the Pacific Ocean. 
It is centered between the nearby state highways, one to the west, 101 to the east, and California State Route 68 to the north. The property's entrance is off East Carmel Valley Road, which all these major routes provide access to. Uh, next slide, please. While most of the property abuts private ranches, portions of its northern and southern boundaries border protected lands owned by the Bureau of Land Management. Approximately five miles southwest of the property is the 1.75 million acre Los Padres National Forest, which extends from the city of Monterey North to Ventura County further south. This project would protect this key wildlife corridor between the Salinas Valley and Los Padres National Forest. Next slide, please. The property is in a regular tract of land with elevation ranges of 1,000 feet along its western boundary to 3,400 feet on the ridges that traverse the eastern portion of the property. Improvements on the property include a 900 square foot single family residence, an adjacent 1,900 square foot barn, along with utilities in the form of electricity and propane. 50 miles of well maintained interior unpaved roads provide vehicle access from the entrance of the property. For the past 40 years, the current owner has utilized the property for recreational purposes and cattle grazing, which conforms to the zoning designation of permanent grazing and permanent farmland. These designations also allow for the opportunity to subdivide the property and develop multiple single family residences. Next slide, please. The property is characterized by a variety of habitats, including oak woodland savanna, chaparral, wetlands, riparian habitat, native grasslands and bunch grasses, along with a diverse assemblage of forbs and wildflowers. There are several perennial creeks that run through the property, including Rana Creek, Aguamala Creek, and Chupines Creek. The waters of these creeks eventually drain into the main stem of the Carmel River watershed, located just west of the property, then eventually drains into the Pacific Ocean in Carmel Bay. Next slide, please. These habitats support numerous wildlife species, including the threatened and endangered species of California red-legged frog, California tiger salamander, and steelhead trout. Additionally, there are species of specialist concern that will benefit from this project, which includes the burrowing owl and monarch butterfly, along with the common species of mountain lion, black bear, deer, golden eagles, coyotes, and bobcats. Due to the listed species, habitat types, and strategic corridor linkages, the property is identified in multiple conservation plans, including CDFW's areas of conservation emphasis, the California State Wildlife Action Plan, and also supports the goals of Pathways 30 by 30 California. Next slide, please. The east side of the property, along with a few outlying communities, have been identified as disadvantaged communities, with some being identified as severely disadvantaged. This proposed project will provide the opportunity for the conservancy to create new free outdoor public access for the nearby underserved communities of Salinas Valley. Next slide, please. The Conservancy will own, manage, and monitor the property as a protected nature preserve, ensuring that the natural resources remain undisturbed and restored for compatible public access and public recreation. Soon after the acquisition, invitations from the Conservancy will go out to members from within the local and tribal communities for discussions related to the property's use and cooperative management. The reserve will be open to the public at no cost for hiking, camping, and other passive recreational activities. The interior roads will serve as trails for hikers and mountain bike riders. Near-term conservation projects include managing and protecting critical wildlife habitat for listed species, maintaining and improving oak woodlands, enhancing stream corridors, and restoring wetlands. Next slide, please. The Department of General Services has approved the fair market value of 26,300,000. Staff recommends approval of this project as proposed. Um, in the audience is uh, Fraser Haney, Executive Director of the Wildlands Conservancy. Um, if you have any questions, we'll be happy to answer them. Thank you. Are there any questions from the board or comments? Damon? I'm glad to see that there are plans for discussions with uh, tribes and local communities about the use of the property and cooperative management. Um, could you maybe give us a little insight as to what discussions, especially with tribes that happened so far and what those uh, next steps in terms of discussions will entail. Absolutely, thank you. Um, and thank you again for considering a grant for this project. Uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful property. We look forward to visiting it with you. Um, locally, uh, we've discussed the project with the Esalen tribe of Monterey County. In your packets, you'll find a support letter from the tribe. 
Um, we've been in discussions with the Esalen tribe about uh, access, uh, co-management with decision making, um, and a variety of other topics from outdoor education to uh, creating some kind of space that the tribe could use uh, for their own purposes, ceremonial access. So those discussions are, are very advanced. I think we haven't signed a memorandum of agreement with the Esalen tribe uh, yet, but I expect that's going to happen very soon. Um, also, as Jason mentioned, and thanks Jason for the excellent presentation, uh, the property consists of 14,100 acres. What we're seeking public funding on at this time is 11,691 acres. Uh, there's some additional steps in the future that will come before the board that in, involve uh, deep tribal engagement for those additional acreages. Um, please. <clears throat> yeah, not a question just as much as in a jam-packed agenda, each project is special in its own right, but not wanting to miss a moment. I Googled the size of a nearby state park, which is Castle, Castle Rock State Park. It's 5,242 acres. So you, you're poised to create something the size of a state park. And I didn't want that to pass for the moment. Um, this, this is, thank you for pointing that out, Chuck, because I, uh, looking at the pictures and imagining and seeing what you're proposing, I just feel really excited about this. Um, but I am curious, did Jason, did you say that there or you can tell me too, will there continue to be uh, cattle grazing or no, it's just been used as? We, we expect to need to continue cattle grazing on the property because of the, the amount of non-native grass. Right. Uh, similar to the Windwolves Preserve. Yeah. Where, where we've really geared our grazing program around the ecological uh, highest benefit. And once you acquire a property like this, how long does it take for it to become accessible to the public? What what we anticipate is that um, we can have invited groups up very quickly. There's some facilities on the property next door, including a 10,000 square foot conference center that the landowner is donating the value of uh, that could be the hub of uh, public education and public access. I think that to get full blown open public access on the property is going to be between three and five years because of uh, some of the local sensitivity to traffic issues along Carmel Valley Road and likely needing to go through some county permitting related to that. Well, I, I hope it happens before my knees blow out. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Any other comments from the board? Um, I just have a just a follow up question. I know in the board report, um, you know, and you just spoke to this about that it will be open to the public at no cost, which I just want to commend you on that <laughs> um, <clears throat> to create affordability for the hiking, camping and passive recreation. So what kind of just outreach marketing, how is it that when you bring on a new um, preserve, how do you get the word out to the public or the community about the preserve and the fact that it is open and, and free to the community? Our, our first step is always to reach out to local high-level leaders, uh, like the Big Sur Land Trust has been a fantastic partner with helping us understand the community and community outreach. Um, folks like the Esalen Tribe of Monterey County. We've also been in touch with the two county supervisors whose district Rana Creek Ranch lies in um, and are taking some direction from them about additional outreach that we need to do. So that's where we start. Um, we haven't done any press on the project until after today. Um, not wanting to, you know. Of course, yeah. <laughs> uh, but that's another way that we want to get on the map with, with folks is to do a press release um, after this meeting and the Coastal Conservancy meeting next week. Once mm -hmm. we have all the funding rounded up, then uh, we can do a press release and start to develop an interest form to collect interest uh, on an email list we can reach out to as well. Okay. All right. Thank you. Are there any speaker cards? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Landon Pepple, did you want to talk? 
Good afternoon, uh, board members. I'm Landon Peppel, the Deputy Director for Conservation and Restoration Programs at the Wildlands Conservancy. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank WCB for their support and effort to protect the Rana Creek Ranch. This acquisition represents one of multiple statewide projects focused on the 30 by 30 objective. And I'd like to highlight three ways this project will achieve it. Uh, foremost, it will provide free equitable access to the local community, including uh, people in the Salinas Valley. Secondly, the landscape will be actively restored and stewarded ecologically with a focus on climate resilience and connectivity and a particular effort around threatened and endangered species habitats. And finally, this preserve will be our 25th nature preserve in California, hosting now over a million visitors a year, and it will afford the durable protections needed to achieve the 30 by 30 vision. Uh, a final thank you to the Wildlife Conservation Board, including so many others that have supported this effort, such as the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, local tribes, um, and many community leaders. So thank you all. Alexa, do we have any hands online? There are no raised hands. Great. Do I have a motion? I'll move approval. I'll second. Great. We have a motion and a second. Take a roll call, please. Chair Bokde? Uh Yes. Vice Chair Bonham? Absolutely. <laughs> Board Member Nagami? Yes. Board Member Pavley? Yes. Board Member Phillips? Yes. Great. Thank you. Motion passes. So we'll move on to item 31. Just would like to note, this is yet another pretty large fee title acquisition, but in Kern County now. So number 31 is Fay Creek Ranch, and Brian Gibson of WCB will present this item and also has tribal involvement. It says withdrawal. Uh, Bay Creek Ranch is located northwest of the community of Weldon in northeastern Kern County near the southern terminus of the Sierra Nevada mountain range. The property is surrounded by conserved land on all sides with the Sequoia National Forest to the north, CDFW's Canebrake Ecological Reserve to the east, Kern River Valley Heritage Foundation's Hanning Flat Preserve to the south, and BLM's Cyrus Canyon area of critical environmental concern to the west. Next slide, please. The property contains a variety of habitats, including chaparral, riparian, and meadow. Species observed on the property include yellow foothill yellow-legged frog and Cooper's hawk. The property also has CDFW documented occurrences of loggerhead shrike and tricolored blackbird. Next slide. The property contains 1.5 miles of Fay Creek, which provides cold water throughout the year. At an elevation of 2,300 feet, Fay Creek creates a natural wildlife corridor connected to the surrounding landscape. The creek flows into the nearby Audubon Society's Kern River Preserve, which is part of a globally important bird area. Next slide. As the last large private holding surrounded by protected lands on all sides, this fee title acquisition will expand connectivity by preserving a wildlife corridor, protect rare and endangered flora and fauna, increase climate resiliency, improve management of water resources, open new public access, and avoid incompatible development in a remote and fragile environment. Next slide. So 1,246 acres of the 2,285 acre property will be conveyed to the Teba Tulabal Tribes nonprofit organization, Teba Tulabals of Kern Valley for long-term stewardship. The remaining 1,039 acres will be transferred to Kern River Valley Heritage Foundation for long-term management. The project will achieve several public benefit objectives, including enhancing wildlife habitat and wildlife corridors threatened by development, improving the health of Fay Creek and South Fork Kern River watersheds and expanding recreational opportunities for visitors in uh, and nearby disadvantaged communities. Next slide. Kern River Valley Heritage Foundation plans to incorporate its portion of the property into the adjacent Hanning Flat Preserve. The Tabatu Labals intend to reconnect their tribal members to places known, used, and described by their grandparents and great grandparents. They will preserve the extensive cultural resources and use the land for seasonal gatherings, 
ceremonial purposes, repatriation of ancestral remains, and traditional activities such as native plant collecting. The Tibal Tula Balls will also permit and manage compatible public access on the properties to trails that connect to Sequoia National Forest's trail network. The DGS approved fair market value is $4,336,929. And uh, in the audience is Peter Colby. He is the California po Program Director for Western Rivers Conservancy. Bruce Vector is on via Zoom. He's the president of Kern River Valley Heritage Foundation. And Robert Gomez is the chairman of the uh, Teba Tulabal tribe. And he's on via Zoom as well. Great, thank you very much. Any comments or questions from the board? Damon. Thank you. So excited about the return of uh, some of this land to the tribes. It's amazing. It should be a model for future projects. Uh, my question is about the grazing. Uh, the board packet says the both owners intend to continue some grazing on the property. Apparently there are some grazing plans. Um, who, which agency sort of oversees the grazing plans and have those been approved? And uh, yeah, I don't know if they've been approved yet. Um, yeah, I, I, I have to actually refer to the, uh, to the grantees on that one. Okay, I guess just want to get a sense of, you know, what does that mean on this property? Is, is it going to be sort of like a steady amount of grazing in the same places? Uh, in perpetuity, is there some condition to limit yeah. sort of not increase grazing, or what? What are the parameters of that? I would I would let the grantees uh, answer that. When I asked asked the question about the grazing, my understanding was that there would be some conti continued light grazing on the properties, but we didn't get into too much of it as far as you know any changes or how extensive it would be. So maybe uh, maybe uh, Peter might know a little bit about. That. Please come on up. Thank you, Brian. I want to appreciate. I want to give my appreciation to the the board for considering this, and for Brian and the rest of the staff for supporting us on what's become a pretty complicated transaction. Actually, in terms of the grazing, it has been historically grazed. Not a lot of cattle out there. Um, we are in the process of working with both of the long term owners uh, on uh, coordinated monitoring and management plans. Uh, we have a draft already that was submitted, uh, and the basic thrust of it is that grazing will be continued. But it will be it will be reviewed and revised as necessary to ensure that it's that the property is grazed in a way that is keeping down invasives, vegetation management, and improving the ecological health. Uh, also, uh, historically, <clears throat> there's been a lot of water taken from springs and from Fay Creek uh, to support the grazing. That will also be reviewed and revised as necessary to keep as much water in stream and again promote the ecological health of the entire property. Right, so WCB staff will have ongoing uh, uh, communications about the grazing or who exactly is doing the oversight? I, I'm not sure what to what extent WCB staff will be involved, but we um, we do have a specific uh, requirement for, for us and, and the um, long-term owners to report ba back on monitoring and management um, to Sierra Nevada Conservancy, the other um, funder who's involved here. So we have specific deliverables for those agencies and those do include um, management and monitoring. Can I get a, a, is the department comfortable with this kind of arrangement? <laughs> Would you be willing to report back to the WCB too with the same kind of just the report you're sending to the Sierra Conservancy sends it to the WCB. Yeah. Certainly, we'll do that. Great, thanks. Thank you. Um, can you? I just have another. I have a question. Um, in the board report, when you say expand recreational opportunities for visitors in nearby disadvantaged communities, can you just speak to that a little bit more? So um, the <clears throat> Kern River Valley Heritage Foundation, of course, has been active in the area for some, for some years with, in particular, acquisition of the Handy Flat property, which was funded in part by WCB, uh, I think, in 2020. Uh, so they're already providing um, access opportunities on Handing Flat. Uh, this will be sort of, for them, an extension of, of Handing Flat. 
It also provides, though, a different access point. So Hanning Flat is accessible from one, Route 178 further west. Uh, this one is, comes up from Route 178 up through Fay Creek Road, and it takes you to the basically to the, the east. Uh, so that access will be available to both Kern River Valley Heritage Foundation and to the tribe. So they'll be able to bring people there through this, through the property up Fay Ranch Road. So it provides a new access point. In addition, the tribe, of course, is new to this. They haven't owned, this is the first land through the tribe zone. So they're new to providing recreational access. However, that's already part of the management plan that we've put in place that that will be provided. So they're anxious to uh, provide ability for people to come up and learn about their heritage and their culture, also about the environmental natural resources on the property. And then in particular, we need to look at um, opening these two trails. There's two different trails historically that have gone up to Kern Plateau. Uh, there, I've been up there, they're very overgrown right now. It's gonna take some effort to get those um, able to be used effectively, but there is definitely a goal to make that, that particular access available to the public. Okay, so part of the future vision would be to potentially develop some trailheads and the trail, a trail system or build a potential trail network. Absolutely. Sounds like. Yeah. How, how long are those existing trails once they're <laughs> restored? That's a good question. <laughs> um, I would guess it's Robert Gomez, if, uh, if he's still online, may know better than I. I would guess uh, several miles up to the plateau mm -hmm. from, from the ranch. Yeah, I just want to commend the partnership with the tribe. So very exciting project. We're, we're very excited. We've done a lot of work with tribes um, over the years, including the Blue Creek Project with the Yurok. And uh, we're really excited to be expanding that uh, across the state. And we'll be bringing more projects to you. Thanks. Great. Are there any speaker cards? No. Alexa, are there any hands raised? There are no raised hands. Okay, uh, what's the pleasure of the board? I'll make a motion. Great. To approve as recommended. Second. Okay, Mary, roll call or vote call. <laughs> Chair Bokke? Uh Yes. Vice Chair Bonham? Yes. Board Member Nagami? Yes. Board Member Pavley? Yes. Board Member Phillips? Yes. Great, motion passes. Um, now we're on to item 32. Rebecca. Yes, thank you. So for item 32, we're uh, moving out to the desert, the Mojave Desert Land Trust Seed Bank Expansion Project. Uh, so we have a new, relatively new staff person that's been um, doing a great work out in our new desert conservation program, and that's Amy Henderson. And so I did ask her just to spend a couple minutes telling you about that new desert conservation program before she goes into this project. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Amy Henderson, Senior Environmental Scientist and the Program Manager for the new Desert Conservation Program. I am delighted to be here today to discuss the program and also um, to show you how I'm implementing it. Next slide. So the Desert Conservation Program was established with the passing of Assembly Bill 1183 on September 28th, 2021, became effective on January 1st, 2022, and I was hired to implement the program in October of 2022. The boundary for this program includes the Mojave and Colorado deserts within California, and um, and it goes from the border of Mexico up into the Owens Valley a little bit, and then also up above Death Valley National Park, and then east to uh, the Nevada and Arizona borders. It intentionally excludes the Coachella Valley Mountains Conservancy, and it covers approximately 26 million acres um, within Imperial, Inyo, Kern, Mono, Los Angeles, Riverside, San Bernardino, and San Diego County. So it's a big area. Next slide. So the Wildlife Conservation Board has been directed by Assembly Bill 1183 to fund projects that do the following. And this is actually taken from from the bill and I'm gonna read them because I love them so much. So 
um, <laughs> were to protect, preserve, and restore the natural, cultural, and physical resources through the acquisition, restoration, and management of lands, promote the protection and restoration of the biological diversity of the region, including the recovery of threatened and endangered species, provide for resilience in the region to climate change, including reducing the risk of wildfires, controlling invasive species, protecting and improving habitat connectivity, and protecting its soil carbon stores by limiting ground disturbance, protect and improve air quality and water resources within the region, and finally, it's to enhance public use and enjoyment of lands owned by the public with an emphasis on expanding opportunities for education and access to public lands for communities that currently lack such access. Next slide. Eligible entities include federal, state, and local governments, local public agencies, nonprofit organizations with 501c3 tax exempt status, and of course, tribes, both federally recognized and um, those listed on our um, California Tribal Consultation list. Next slide. So a few updates. Um, the web page is up and it's on WCB's website and I encourage all of you to go up over there and take a look at it. Um, since October, I've conducted outreach to over 31 entities and continue to engage with tribes, local nonprofits, science advisory groups, technical advisory groups, CDFW regional staff, and state and federal agencies. Next slide. So the Desert Conservation Program is funded through general funds. Um, and thus far, we have received 13 pre-applications, three acquisition, and 10 development projects. We've invited nine of those to submit full applications with two of them being presented for board consideration, one today and then one in August. So I am looking forward to continuing to develop this new program and would welcome any questions you may have. Thank you. Um, are there any questions, comments? From the board. Uh, Catherine. I'll, I'll make a comment in that, you know, government is often very, very slow, but I think from the point that Assemblymember Ramos uh, introduced the bill to getting to where you are already, it's just only been two years, and that's a big deal. That's like the speed of light in government terms. So thank you for doing what you've done and, and already uh, reviewing that many applicants and, and visiting those and talking to those many people. Absolutely. I've enjoyed and, every minute of it. And um, kudos to the legislature for not only passing the original bill, but also providing the funding uh, with the governor. Anyone else? No board members? Okay, are there any public comments? No, she needs to go ahead with her. Um, Alexa. There are no Alexa, raised hands. Okay, thanks. She knows what to do. Oh, okay. okay. All right, great. So, do I have a? She needs to go ahead with the actual project. Oh, the actual yeah. project. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm reading about the project, and I'm like, oh, this is so great. Sorry. <laughs> My apologies. Show. Yes. Fine. Lost me. Okay. okay. So this proposal is to consider the allocation for a grant to the Mojave Desert Land Trust for a seed bank expansion project to preserve the California desert's biodiversity and address the need for native seed repositories that can be used to restore ecosystem function throughout the region. Seed collection will occur across the desert on lands owned by the land trust or where the land trust holds a conservation easement in Imperial, Inyo, Kern, San Bernardino, and Riverside counties. Next slide. In January of this year, the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine released a report titled An Assessment of Native Seed Needs and the Capacity for Their Supply Final Report, which looks at federal, state, tribal, and private sector needs and capacity for supplying native plant seeds for ecological restoration and other purposes, with a focus on the Western states. The assessment concluded that there is a severe shortage of source identified genetically appropriate native seed available for restoration and that the need for such seed is urgent. The report recommends supporting regional programs and partnerships with seed banks and nurseries, supporting responsible seed collection and long-term seed banking, 
supporting basic research, and collaborating with private and nonprofit partners on expanding seed storage and seed cleaning infrastructure. As California's landscapes and biodiversity continue to face mounting threats from climate change, wildfire, invasive species, and habitat loss, the need for long-term native seed protection is critical. Seed banking has become a crucial tool for biodiversity protection by acting as an insurance policy and maintaining a repository of source-identified genetically appropriate seed that can be used to restore the desert's flora. Information stored in the Land Trust Seed Bank is also a value to scientists studying climate change in other regions. Desert plants have unique adaptations to allow them to survive harsh conditions, and genetic information on these adaptations is of particular interest to scientists as other regions of the world are becoming increasingly arid due to climate change, with factors such as drought, extreme temperatures, and salt in both water and soil posing a significant threat to native fauna. This project will include increasing capacity to collect, process, and store seed representing an additional 300 taxa, conducting research and developing protocols that can be shared with the larger conservation community, creating an inventory of California desert seed for use in restoration projects throughout the region, and developing and implementing outreach and educational materials to further the public's knowledge about the importance of California's native plants and the role of seed banking. Next slide. Seed collecting, cleaning, processing, and storing are labor-intensive tasks. Seed banking begins with mapping and scouting the populations to be collected. Timing is critical and multiple inspections of ripening fruits may be necessary to ensure seed viability. The image on the left is showing volunteers collecting screw bean mesquite fruits. The image on the right is an up-close look at the fruit. Seed, next slide, please. Seed processing and cleaning is done either by hand or by using seed cleaning equipment. Screw bean mesquite is one of the more labor-intensive species that the land trust processes. The fruit is a hard coiled pod that has to be opened with pliers to extract the seeds without jam damaging them. This is done by hand as shown here on the left. Each seed is then examined to ensure it isn't infested with larvae of the bruchid beetle and then tested for viability. All viable seeds are placed in a jar. The seed shown on the right took approximately 40 to 50 hours to clean and process. So you can see it's a lot of a lot of work to get a little bit of seed. Next slide, please. So following collection, processing, cleaning, and testing, viable seeds are labeled and cataloged and placed into long-term cold storage until needed. If we're going to increase the pace and scale of restoration in California, we must also increase the pace and scale of native seed collection and propagation. Staff recommends that the Wildlife Conservation Board approve the project as proposed. And in the audience with me is Medina Asbel, Director of Plant Conservation Programs, and Kelly Herbinson, Joint Executive Director of the Mojave Desert Land Trust. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, any questions, comments from the board? Okay, uh, any speaker cards? Oh, I'm, I'm just oh. curious. Um, so this will help improve the, the speed and volume of, of seed collection. Is that mainly by adding staff or? Yeah, it's increasing the capacity. Yeah, so there'll be, um, it'll be between volunteers and also hired paid staff to go out and um, do the collecting. And recruit and, 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 yeah. and, and manage the volunteers. And great year for it. Yeah, for sure. Okay, any other questions, comments? All right, do we have any speaker cards? Alexa, do we have any raised hands? Oh, I see a raised hand. Oh, there's Jason. <laughs> uh, Landon Peppel, the Wildlands Conservancy, here to support this project. Uh, I'm fortunate to live at the Wind Wolves Preserve where we conduct a variety of restoration projects. And I can unequivocally state that the Mojave Desert Land Trust in Medina uh, has been key to providing the native plants for our restoration projects. Um, local genotypes, a variety of species, uh, wetland plants, desert shrubs, riparian trees, 
uh, stinging nettle for tricolor blackbird. It's come out of their nursery. So we're excited to see this project happen and highly supportive. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, do I have a board motion? I'll make a motion to approve the item as staff recommends. I'll second. Great. Would you like to take the roll call, please? Chair Bokde? Yes. Vice Chair Bonham? Yes. Board Member Nagami? Yes. Board Member Pavley? Yes. Board Member Phillips? Yes. Great. Uh, motion carries. So I guess 33, item 33 and item 34 are withdrawn from consideration at this time. So we will move to our last project item, uh, item number 35. Rebecca? Great. So item 35 is Imperial Wildlife Area Wetland Restoration Phase 3 to the California Waterfowl Association. And James Croft of WCB will present. Sorry, I got stuck, stuck in traffic there. Good afternoon. This proposal is to consider the allocation for a grant to California Waterfowl Association for a cooperative project with California Department of Fish and Wildlife to enhance 2,893 acres of wetland habitat for the benefit of migratory birds at the Imperial Wildlife Area, located on the southeastern shoreline of the Salton Sea. Since 2013, previous phases of this wetland enhancement effort have allocated $5.1 million to enhance 1,757 acres of wetland habitat at the wildlife area. This project represents the final phase of work to enhance the remaining wetland units on the wildlife area and completes a decade-long effort to provide high-quality managed wetland habitat within Southern California. Next slide, please. The Imperial Wildlife Area was designated as a wildlife area for the, by the California Fish and Game Commission in 1951. The wildlife area is comprised of approximately 8,000 acres of salt marshes, freshwater wetlands, and desert scrub. The wildlife area provides habitat for migratory birds and is a critical stop along the Pacific Flyway for waterfowl. Visitors to the wildlife area can enjoy wildlife viewing, waterfowl and upland game bird hunting, and fishing. Several state-listed threatened and endangered species are present at the wildlife area, including bald eagle, Swainson's hawk, Yuma clapper rail, and the sandhill crane. Next slide, please. Wetland habitat conditions within the project area have been poor for several years, with degraded water delivery systems being the biggest hindrance to effective management of the seasonal wetland units. Open water delivery ditches within the project area grow a significant amount of salt cedar and Phragmites. Next slide, please. The water-hungry invasive plants reduce water conveyance capability within delivery ditches and use the ditch water to spread their seeds. Salt cedar and Phragmites provide little benefit ecological, ecologically to the wildlife area and currently are excavated from ditches and interior levees by wildlife area managers every two to three years. Next slide, please. This project continues previous efforts to restore wetland habitat at the Imperial Wildlife Area by implementing a proven restoration approach. The project will mechanically only, no herbicides, mechanically remove invasive salt cedar and Phragmites using heavy equipment to remove and transport the excavated plant matter offsite for disposal. Removing these invasive plants is the first step to increasing the availability of needed resources for wetland dependent species within the project area. To ensure that invasive plants can no longer colonize the water delivery ditches, these ditches will be replaced with buried high density polyethylene pipes. Pipelines guaranteed no ditch loss, no annual maintenance costs, eliminates the invasive seed source, and improves water delivery capabilities to wetland units by allowing independent water delivery and efficient drainage. These enhancements allow wetland managers to best manage the seasonal wetland units to provide needed resources for wetland dependent species within the project area. Next slide, please. To complete restoration of the seasonal wetland units, the project will excavate new levees, islands, swales, and install water control structures to improve wetland management capabilities. These enhancements will create high value habitat for a variety of species throughout the year. Increased water conservation will enable less water to be used more efficiently on a larger acreage. At the same time, improved water quality and soil health will be elevated due to reduced residual salt loads within the wetland units. And this will improve growing conditions for moist soil plants, increasing resource production for foraging waterfowl and shorebirds. 
uh, back in about, I think, 2008, California Waterfowl Association began this multi-phase project with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife to kind of in a step-by-step -step motion um, complete, you know, 100 acres here, 100 acres there, wetland restoration at the Imperial Wildlife Area. Uh, we've been working with multiple projects since then um, to get these uh, additional wetland acres done. And now that we're kind of in a in an area where we have a little more money to kind of take away bigger chunks of wetland acreage, uh, we're um, kind of fast forwarding or, or uh, combining multiple phases into this final phase in order to kind of be more efficient. We're going to be able to um, send less construction crews out to do more acres and to create kind of what you see here. So what you see here is these, these are water grass moist soil plants that are within a wetland unit with a swale running through the middle. Um, this is from a project that we closed out in 2022. Um, this used to be maybe five or six feet of salt cedar and throughout the entirety of this wetland unit. And so now we have actually uh, resources for uh, foraging waterfowl. So um, yeah, staff recommends that the Wildlife Conservation Board approve this project as proposed. Here today to answer any questions you have is Chad Santier, Wetland Program Supervisor from the California Waterfowl Association. Thank you. Thank you. Any comments, questions from the board? Any speaker cards? Oh, sorry, please. Part of the state that deserves all the attention we can give. Yeah. Any speaker cards? No. Alex, any hands raised? There are no raised hands. All right. So do I have a board motion? Great. I'll second. Thank you. All right, let's take the roll call. Chair Boke? Yes. Vice Chair Bonham? Yes. Board Member Nagami? Yes. Board Member Pavley? Board Member Phillips? Yes. Great, motion passes, thank you. So now we'll move on to Rebecca, your executive director's report. Yay. How exciting. I know. <laughs> Great job, board, a wonderful set of projects. And I just have a few quick items to run through. Um, first and foremost, uh, wanted to highlight to the board, all the new staff that we have. It's just been amazing. So I think you mentioned, I mentioned in the past, or Donna had mentioned in the past that we had received a number of, uh, positions in the last budget cycle. We have filled all those positions. So just to highlight some of those new positions. And then we also had some vacancies, which we have all backfilled at this point. So beyond an executive director, we're actually at almost full capacity here. Uh, so some of the new employees, and they're here, I think, in the room. So if you are, you have to wave. Daniel Vasquez, he's our second supervisor for acquisition. Geneva Iverson Cramps, one of our new environmental scientists. Haley Petchner, another environmental scientist. We've got Kristen Valvianos, our new attorney. She's up here in the front. Um, and then the highly awaited information officer, Mark Topping. I think he's in the booth. There he is in the booth. <laughs> so we have great plans for Mark. Um, and Alexa Dunn, you know, who is out back there running the system, but she's now moved from the restoration side to the acquisition side. So just in particular, acquisition is gained several additional staff to help with all the work that they're doing. Uh, Jennifer Stanfield is here and she's our new forest program manager. So I think Judah Grossman, you may have known, is went to a different agency. Kendall Webster is our new amazing right-of-way agent and also our new tribal liaison. So she's coming to us with some real interest there and is pulling together a list of all the projects that we're doing with the tribes, which is also very exciting. Kim Cruz is another senior right-of-way. She's back in the back there, and she's actually located out of Southern California. And then Michael Shaw, who is here also as a senior right away agent. And not to forget, we have also have a retired annuitant, Ann Malcolm, which some of you know, because she's been helping with some special <laughs> projects. And then last but not least, Alyssa Benedetti has gotten a promotion. She had been in the Streamflow program, but she now is our public access program manager. So I just can't say how much we appreciate being back at full staff with all the funding that we're trying to get out on the street. And these guys work tirelessly to get these projects developed and to you in a quick, quick as manner as possible. So that's super exciting. Um, other quick note, just on outreach, we have done a series of outreach meetings just in the last couple of months. We had staff going out with the Department of Fish and Wildlife and State Coastal Conservancy to specifically talk about our grants. 
And so they had three different meetings in that regard. We also were in the Bay Area at a Together Bay Area function, talking about, again, our programs. So the intent though now with Mark on board is actually to bring in August to you some more specific conversation around public outreach and also get your input on what you guys would like to see in a public outreach strategy. So more on that soon. And then we are continuing kind of our work in the uh, equity front. So there was a subcommittee meeting for, of the board. And I think we actually had Damon on point just to say a couple words about their most recent meeting there. Thanks, yeah, just a couple words. We have a, an equity and justice subcommittee. We've had a meeting, we plan to meet again. We are looking at uh, additional criteria for equity to achieve our equity uh, goals and objectives here at WCB. We heard a presentation by a professor and associate of mine and many of us, John Christensen, who's a professor at UCLA who works on park equity issues. And he is looking at some exciting tools that use mapping to sort of overlay um, uh, disadvantaged and underserved communities with existing tools that the department actually uses in terms of uh, conser uh, conservation, areas of conservation emphasis, so the ACE maps. So we can really hone in on what's a place where we can achieve and maximize our both our equity goals and our conservation goals at the same time and our restoration goals. Uh, so more soon on that, uh, it's a very lively and energetic uh, subcommittee and we're excited to continue our work. Yeah, that group's also meeting again here just in a few weeks after some additional analysis is happening. Uh, one other last quick note is that um, for the Bagley Keen exemption that we've had where we haven't had to do all of the usual noticing of public meetings, that actually is expiring. So our August meeting and our November meeting, we may be in a situation where if you're coming in remotely, you're going to need to notice that location. So we will communicate more with the board in the interim on how to deal with that. There is a, a bill in process that could fix that again for folks, but we won't know if that passes or and it wouldn't go in effect till January. So just a heads up for the board on that. And then the last item, uh, which I promised at the very begin, beginning in my teaser was just to uh, make a quick note that of course, this is the first time we have not had John Donnelly in the room for 27 years of WCB board meetings. So uh, do you have that slide? The next slide, please. And so I don't know that this is visible. It's visible on the big screen. Uh, so we are, of course, celebrating John this afternoon at Drake's Barn. And this map will be there in person, but does just give you a snapshot of the 1,500 projects that happened under his tenure as executive director. It's a billion and a half worth of projects. And look at all the stuff in Southern California for you Southern California folks. <laughs> I think it's... It's yes, yeah. and he was down. He was down in yeah. Southern California this last weekend. But I don't know that we can say enough, you know, the impact that he had on WCB and our program and our staff and the work we do and how passionate he feels about the work that we're doing in California. So we are going to celebrate that this afternoon, but wanted to leave you with this image of just uh, the impact that we can and can continue to make as an agency and how much John was a part of that as executive director for the last 17 years. So I know he's, he'll have to come look at the recording of this because he didn't show up today, I see. I can't believe it, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but yes, yeah, so we could all, <laughs> yes. But just wanted to make sure we made that public acknowledgement um, of just all the work he did and how much we appreciate him. And we'll miss him, of course. You did a very good job today, Rebecca. Oh, thank you, yeah, <laughs> thank you. Agreed. And a so, small note, Rebecca, but it's not up there anymore. But you, I know you had forests and oak woodlands, and that in Southern California is very, very helpful because we always have this uh, feeling chip on our shoulder. <laughs> People say forests; it has to be redwoods or pines, mm -hmm. and that if it isn't that, it doesn't count for watersheds or anything. So I like I like that addition, <laughs> oak woodlands. Perfect. Great. Any comments from the board or questions for Rebecca? All right. Well, great report and um, just welcome to all the staff. Very excited to have you on board and um, very much looking forward to working with all of you. So 
I think uh, at this point we are going to go into closed session to talk about uh, our, our executive session. So, um, so we'll, what's the process? Adjourn we'll and then come back? The or? Second floor. Okay. So if everyone wants to follow us, we'll take you up there. Right. And All right. Thank you. Everyone. So the meeting stays open. Yes. Meeting stays open. We'll, Correct, we'll yeah. come back to adjourn. Yeah. We'll yeah. All right. Well, we are back from executive session, closed executive session. So can you please uh, report out from the session, Colin? Yes. The board met in closed session pursuant to Bagley Keene with its council. Council provided the board with an update on the timeline for the executive director hiring process. Great, thank you. So I think with that, we will officially adjourn the Wildlife Conservation Board meeting at 3.50 p.m. on Thursday, May 25th. Thank you.